Great, thank you, Doug. I was actually uh, just a few minutes ago frantically searching for the email with the, the Zoom link for this. I guess that's sort of a sign of the, the, the times, uh, I guess, and would have been especially embarrassing if I could find the Zoom link to my own seminar. Uh, but I did find it and I'm here and we'll embark on the seminar. I'd like to uh, tell everybody good afternoon or good morning if you're in Western Kentucky or, or points even farther west as, as I know some of our people may be. And welcome to the 60th annual Kentucky Geological Survey Annual Seminar. Uh, you think about it, 60 years is quite an accomplishment to, to have an ongoing meeting like that. Uh, as Doug mentioned, I'm Bill Hanneberg. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Kentucky State Geologist and Geological Survey Director. Uh, before we start the presentations in the program, I wanna make a few opening remarks. Uh, and talk a little bit about the, the theme for the seminar and, and how it, it came to be. Um, some of you may also know that traditionally our in-person seminars over the years have included a state of the survey presentation. And that's one of the things we eliminated last year and this year, just uh, to avoid the, the Zoom fatigue, uh, we wanted to try to streamline the meeting as much as we could. Uh, but I'll be around uh, throughout the, the seminar if anybody has any questions they wanna ask and also, I think we'll have a few minutes left at the end of my opening remarks before we move on to the Haney lecture. So we could we can treat that as a kind of an open burning questions about KGS that you'd like to ask. And we'll uh, that'll give you some opportunity to at least get some of the information you would have gotten from a, a state of the survey address. The KGS annual seminar, some of you already know this and some may not actually began uh, 60 years ago now as an annual gathering of the mappers during the, uh, what I call the epic Kentucky geologic collaboration with the US Geological Survey because nothing like that had ever happened before in the United States. And I think it's probably pretty close to being unparalleled in the entire world in terms of the intensity and, and the level of detail that was uh, mapping that was done during the, the short period. And I think we're, we're justifiably proud of that collaboration. Uh, Kentucky is unfortunately near the bottom of a lot of lists in, in state rankings, but geological mapping is one category where Kentucky has for, for decades and continues to be really the undisputed leader first in the, the effort to map the state completely at, at such a level of detail. And even now, as we continue to update and refine and find better ways to operate our interactive Kentucky geologic map service. So during the, the, the original mapping project uh, took 22 years or 18 years of mapping and another four years to get the maps published. Uh, but I think it's, it's phenomenal that a total of 707, one to 24,000 geologic quadrant maps covering the entire state were completed and published. And if you do the math, that comes out to an average of 32 quadrangles per year, which is an, an amazing effort. Uh, and, and Think about that for a few seconds, that they were doing this in uh, pre-internet, pre-cell phone, pre-GIS days, and, and even, uh, yes, pre-Zoom days. Uh, the interstate system was still in its infancy. Uh, our, our Kentucky parkways weren't in existence when they started, and, and they were using basic colored pencils and India ink and vellum to draft maps by hand under very trying conditions. Uh, in that initial mapping alone, not, not including the, the subsequent time that we spent digitizing and, and working on web development, took 690 person years. And we estimate the total cost in current dollars would be about $85 million, which is a, an amazing investment in Kentucky. And there've been a number of studies showing that the, the, the costs of that have been repaid many times over in terms of the, the benefits they brought to us. So it was just a, a, an outstanding uh, effort and investment in Kentucky. And it, in those years, the annual seminar started off as an opportunity for the, the mappers to meet and discuss their strategy and stratigraphy and to coordinate their activities. But over the years, it's evolved to become our largest 
uh, stakeholder event and, and probably the largest annual gathering of geologists in Kentucky. I don't know of anything that occurs on a regular yearly basis that brings so many geologists together on one day in Kentucky. So this is the, uh, the second consecutive year in which the circumstances have really made an online seminar the only viable option. Uh, we're, we're certainly getting to the point where we can seriously think next year we'll be able to do this in person. Um, but this year we're, we're still doing it virtually. Uh, and we also can't really escape the fact that this past year has seen a, a lot of tremendous human loss and economic disruption and social upheaval and political turmoil. Uh, and, and we are, uh, we recognize and, and understand that the gravity of all those things, uh, we've redoubled our commitment at KGS to look at things like diversity and equity and inclusivity. And I hope that, that this year's seminar can really allow us a few hours to, to gather as, as professionals and focus on some of the good things we can do as geoscientists, talk about how we can benefit society through the information we provide uh, the knowledge that can be used to make sound science-based policy decisions and, and in general to make the world a better place. And I'm very optimistic that we can do that. Each year we pick a different sub seminar theme. Uh, this year, the, the theme we went with is Big Earth Data Forging New Frontiers. And as the seminar announcements you may have seen said that uh, data are at the core of science and the more science grows, the more data grows. Uh, which is, I, I think, of, of course, true. But I also think it works the other way around. As we develop uh, new kinds of data, we're able to do new kinds of science or do it uh, in, in much better ways uh, or, or communicate it in, in ways we hadn't imagined before. So in, in a sense, it, it works both ways. The availability of new data gives us a, a really an unlimited range of new opportunities and uh, and, and chances to, to rethink what we're doing as a science, and especially in, in an applied organization like KGS, how we're, we're helping to benefit Kentucky and, and the world in general. Uh, and one example I always like to use, because I've worked with it a lot over the years, is airborne LIDAR. And that's a technology that didn't exist when I started my career in geology. If you would have talked about it, somebody would have thought you were reading a science fiction novel, the idea that you could fly around in an airplane with a laser scanner and then mathematically subtract the trees and, and get these amazing images and, and digital elevation models of Earth's surface would be kind of mind boggling. But in the past uh, 25 years or so, it's gone from being sort of an exotic technology. Uh, I remember when I would go to GSA meetings or uh, back in those days and, and people would say, well, I have, you've used LIDAR, you've actually seen LIDAR, is it really amazing as they say, to now where it's, it's almost a, co a commodity, it's certainly not hard to find. Uh, a lot of states, including Kentucky, have complete coverage. And I think the important thing is that it's a technology that, that's truly changed the way we can document and understand the earth and, and superficial geology and geological hazards and geological processes. We can even start using it now for things like change detection and monitoring of, of processes, things like erosion and, and landsliding. Uh, and underwater, if you're interested in, in marine geology, although it's, it's not really currently a concern in Kentucky, uh, being in the middle of the continent, uh, but we have analogous uh, technologies like multi-beam echo sounding, uh, and that produces lighter quality digital seafloor models that allow us to do the same thing with the seafloor as we do on land, but in this case, in, in many thousands of feet of water using autonomous underwater vehicles. So just amazing new technology uh, that, that didn't exist not too long ago. Uh, and these new technologies produce just a, a phenomenal amount of data. And all that data needs to be acquired, it needs to be processed, it needs to be analyzed, and most importantly, archived and interchanged. Uh, you hear a lot about the, the, the FAIR data principles, that data should be findable and accessible and interoperable and, and reusable. Uh, as we're getting more and more data, it, it, it's becoming more and more important to make sure that the data are findable and accessible and usable. And also that we have the, the computational expertise and the, the human knowledge to process and, and analyze and communicate that data, not only efficiently, but effectively and honestly. Uh, 
the more you use data, the, the more you realize it, it, it can be used poorly or it can be used well, and we want to make sure we use it well. Uh, it's just as an, an example of some of the magnitude of the data, uh, the Kentucky statewide LIDAR DEM, which is LIDAR DEMs go, isn't phenomenally accurate. It, it has an elevation every five feet, uh, but that takes, it comprises just about 46 billion cells to cover the entire state of Kentucky. Uh, and sometimes I like to tell people that's 46 billion pieces of information that we as geologists can use to better understand the Commonwealth and, and the geological processes and the landscape that we all live and thrive in. Uh, if you go up a step and say, well, okay, let's, let's look beyond this gridded digital elevation model, which is sort of the process deliverable nominal product, and actually look at the, the what's called the, the point cloud, which is the record of every laser return from the scan. And that includes multiple returns if the laser bounces off the ground and off a tree, or maybe a car inside the side of a house, sort of like a billiard shot, which they do sometimes. Uh, so it includes information about multiple returns and the intensity of the returns and the off nadir angle, and a lot of things like that that we could conceivably use to make better digital elevation models and interpret the earth. Uh, well, for Kentucky alone, for the first coverage, that, that number really quickly grows to nearly half a trillion pieces of information, which is just amazing. And that's just for one snapshot of Kentucky. It, it took about six years to make that snapshot uh, because the funding was, was piecemeal from a lot of different agencies and there are limited flying windows. So it wasn't an instantaneous snapshot. It did take several years. Uh, but basically, one snapshot of Kentucky is giving us depending on how you look at it, as, as many as half a trillion pieces of information. And that's just one coverage. If you throw in things like mobile coverages, we're actually starting on our second round of coverage in, in Kentucky, uh, and then it'll take a few years to complete. We also have high resolution aerial photographs, uh, visible and, and even in a near infrared, we have things like satellite imagery. Uh, we have subsurface information ranging from seismic lines to Warhole information, cores, ge geophysical logs, cuttings, uh, geologic maps, and, and the, the total amount of information is mind boggling. And I think that's right now, uh, that's one of our, our biggest challenges is to look at all the information we have. It's almost like you open a garage door uh, of, of where you put stuff over the years, not really realizing how much is there. And you see the accumulated amount of stuff. And it's a huge challenge to say, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to organize it? How are we going to make it efficient so we can find things, so we can use them? Uh, and, and, and that's what we're working on these days, largely at, at the survey. So we, as geoscientists, aren't strangers to big data. There are a lot of things we've done over the years that produce huge amounts of data. Uh, if you look at the a list, uh, go on the internet and search for a list of the world's most powerful or largest privately owned supercomputers, uh, you're always going to find oil companies up there. And that's because for decades, they've had the need and, and also could afford to, to buy the computers to process things like high resolution 3D data, and now even uh, 4D seismic data. And, and, and in a lot of regards, your scientists have been on the, <clears throat> the forefront of scientific community, uh, computing. Uh, but there's, there's more to geology than just oil and gas, uh, and, and there's more to, to big data than just processing and crunching numbers. So when we chose the thing for big data, we wanted to do something more than just give another set of presentations about artificial intelligence or machine learning. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of those these days. The words big data are almost synonymous with artificial intelligence and what we can do with it and, and how powerful it is. Uh, and it certainly offers a lot of potential. My experience has been as well that geologic problems are some of the hardest to apply uh, techniques of artificial intelligence or machine learning to because they're complicated problems that, that require a lot of subjectivity and experience, say, to interpret a landscape or interpret a topographic map or a geological map or understand what a landslide looks like. I mean, it's a really hard thing given, say, all the different kinds of landslides, the different processes and products and source materials and terrains and topographic settings and ages uh, 
to encapsulate what a landslide should look like. But an experienced geologist will be able to look at, uh, look at an, say, an image and aerial photograph or a topographic map and, and make that judgment. But it, it's still, for the most part, things like that are, are really beyond the, the practical limitations of artificial intelligence these days. Uh, so we wanted to go beyond just dry talks of, about computing and artificial neural networks. Uh, we really wanted to avoid the topic of things like file formats because nothing will kill a party faster than a discussion of file formats, or at least in, in my experience. Uh, but we did want to address a lot of really important ancillary questions and, and think about the ways that we present and preserve data, the ways about we think about the data and the ways we collaborate to share data. So in a way you might think of this is a, a focus on a lot of the, the soft topics surrounding the, the, the hardcore technical aspects of, of big data and computing with it. And like in a lot of other fields, the, the so-called soft topics aren't really soft at all. They're generally the much harder questions, uh, they're much more difficult to quantify and even to conceptualize and, and solve, but they're, they're critical to the success of the entire endeavor. Uh, by data too, I think it's easy, again, given our, our, our times here in the, uh, the early part of the 21st century, that when we think about data, we almost instantaneously, you think about electronic stuff and bits and bytes and, and petaflops, uh, storage capacity, things like that. Uh, and, and those are all important. They're, they provide tremendous benefits to us. But I think as geoscientists, we also understand there's an incredible value in physical data, things like cores and, and well cuttings. Uh, so it's incumbent for us to, to think about that, but also to communicate the importance of those to a lot of people. I've been at Earl, which is our core and well sample facility with people uh, who are not geologists and they've looked around and they've sort of taken a, a few seconds to take in all these, these rows and rows of pallets and boxes of samples and said sort of incredulously, what, what do you do with all this stuff? And what, what good are rocks doing uh, us here in Kentucky? And that's our job is to figure out how to take that data and communicate its value and its importance to a lot of people. Uh, so we were actively working not just on digital kinds of things and worrying about uh, computer clusters, and we, you know, we have our digital earth analysis lab to do a lot of work on LIDAR, but we're also actively working on, uh, uh, for example, better ways to photograph and archive and organize the physical samples at Earl, uh, which is for those who aren't familiar with it, the, the earth analysis research library. Uh, it's what we used to call the, the uh, well sample and core facility. Uh, you are emphatically not allowed to call it a core barn or a core shed because it's neither a barn or a shed. It's, it's actually a, a functioning scientific research facility. Uh, and we're quite, kind of picky about that. Uh, but we are actively working on preserving and archiving and, and cataloging those samples. And sadly too, some of our job is, is figuring out how to get rid of some uh, during many years of mismanagement over several decades. Uh, Earl accepted a lot of cores and samples, for example, that didn't have any supporting information, like locations, where did it come from? Uh, data like that without any kind of context is of really limited value to us. Uh, we also have a lot of samples that were waterlogged when the previous facility was flooded decades ago, but they were never properly processed afterwards or treated. They were just set there in cloth bags. Uh, to glue themselves together and, and, and become moldy. So we're having to go through and systematically deaccession some of those because we, we have limited space and resources and we want to always be able to accept new, useful quality information that, that has that context with it instead of taking up space, for example, for core, if we don't know where the borehole was located that, that the core came from. Uh, we also, want to think about the ways we, we th think about the data, the way we present the data to other people, the way we conceptualize it in our minds and, and communicate what can be really complicated data sets, large data sets, multi-dimensional data sets, uh, data sets depicting things we can't see like the, the subsurface of the earth, 
Uh, how do we envision what's there? Not just as geologists do this for a living, but also as uh, to people who might not understand it. Uh, and then finally, geoscience is inherently spatial, and, and that means maps. And they're some of our most important tools to understand and, and communicate about the world. And a professional geologist is going to have much different needs and expectations than, say, a planner or an insurance actuary or an emergency response coordinator or even a family out for a weekend hike. So we really need to think consciously about the choices we make when we make maps, how they're going to be used, how they're going to be perceived, and particularly uh, our mission at KGS to provide unbiased data that people can rely on to make policy-based decisions. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll start wrapping up here and tell you that we have here today is our, our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Sarah Battersby uh, from Tableau Research, and she's gonna give this year's Donald Haney Distinguished Lecture in Applied Geology. Um, many of you knew or have heard of Dr. Haney. He was the state geologist and KGS director from 1978 to 1999. And he started the practice many years ago when, when he was state geologist, uh, bringing in distinguished speakers to KGS to share their knowledge of, about practical or applied geology. And after a hiatus of a number of years, we, we restarted that program uh, and have, have been bringing in people uh, to, to give the Haney lecture. And this year is uh, Dr. Battersby, who's uh, actually a geographer and her primary focus is in cartography uh, with an emphasis on cognition and, and her work emphasizes ways that we can help people visualize and use spatial information uh, more effectively. And, and she noted in the, the stuff she sent us that no advanced degree in geospatial science is required. So you can all relax and, and there won't be a quiz afterwards. Uh, Dr. Battersby has a PhD in GIS science from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, she's a member of the International Cartographic Association Commission on Map Projections. So if you want to know about map projections, now would be a good time to ask. Uh, she's a past president of the Cartographic and Geographic Information Society. And uh, she's also, and this is where I first met her, a member, in fact, actually the co-chair of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. And the topic of her presentation today is going to be how people think about maps, analytics, and building trust. Thanks, Bill. I just had to find my button to unmute myself. Um, so thank you guys for inviting me in to talk with you today. Um, this is really one of my favorite topics to think about and to talk about, uh, which is how people think about maps. And I am really glad that I kind of like psychically picked up on the don't talk about file formats for 50 minutes, because I did manage to cut that out of the talk, even though um, spatial file formats are really weird and really interesting. And they do actually overlap a bit with some of the challenges and the way people think about maps. But I will not talk about file formats. I will talk about map projections, though, because I do, I do love those. So in my talk today, I'm going to discuss some of the interesting ways that people use maps to make sense of the world and how sometimes the things that we see in maps may be misleading. And since um, for the last seven years or so, I've been working primarily in this, this industry world that emphasizes self-service spatial analytics. A lot of the examples that I'm gonna use will be focused on that particular realm, but the challenges as I see them um, with how people think about maps and how analytics and trust issues come in really underlie just about any map or mapping tool that we work with. And before I dive too deep, um, I just want you to know, I do have the chat window open. So if I start going too fast, especially for any of the, uh, for either of the ASL interpreters, just put something in the chat window and I will try and try and note it and adjust accordingly. So one of my big passions in life is thinking about the challenges that come up with analyzing, exploring, and communicating with maps. I mean, this is really, you know, this is what gets me up in the morning. I want to think about, you know, where can things go wrong and how do we do it right? And I would say that in general, um, people are really pretty good at making sense of spatial patterns on a map um, because we've got these eyes that are really great sensors of patterns. We see things, we can make sense of it. And, you know, when a map is made really well, we can find important patterns really fast. But 
with a lot of things in life, um, you know, there will be dragons along the way. And in the talk today, I'm going to talk about what I see as being a few of the big dragons that come up in both map design and in analytics, um, particularly when people are part of the process. And it turns out that you know, people are really always part of the process. We're collecting the data, we're doing the analysis, we're designing the maps. And it turns out that people don't often think or don't always think about spatial data in a way that aligns with you know, what we understand about the 3D world around us or how it's represented in the computers that we're using to create a lot of our maps. And just as a, a side note before I get too far, I want to point out in this talk, um, you know, it's going to be far from comprehensive in terms of the crazy things that people do with maps or how we find patterns. Um, so after the talk, please feel free to be in touch if you want to talk more about your know, resources on cartographic design, spatial visualization challenges, or if you just want to send me some of the really weird maps that you find, because I do, I do love those. Um, this, is, this is what I like to do all day at work, at least when they give me the time to sit and think about the weird things that people think about maps. So just a little background on how I approach the topic of how people think about and use maps. Um, you know, when we're making or reading a map, we can look at the map in two ways. Um, the first is you know, what I have is the vertical axis here. You know, is the data appropriately represented? And this is, this is really a question of whether the data is appropriate for the map and is following basic symbolization principles that would support making an easy to interpret and understandable map. Um, but it also includes questions of whether or not the data were properly analyzed and whether or not the symbolization is intuitive and follows good um, cartographic guidelines. The second way I think about things is, you know, how nice does the map look? And, you know, we'll just put this on, you know, kind of a good everyday scale. Um, you know, on one end, we have the, you know, would your mom or your spouse or your kids or your roommate say, you know, that, that's great that you made that map, but let's not put it on the fridge. Um, all the way over to the other end of the scale, which might be, you know, let's call it the National Geographic side or the, you know, this will go viral on Twitter end of design. You know, it really looks awesome. Now, if we have high quality um, and completely appropriate data representation and analysis, but the design is amateurish or unattractive, we end up with this map with great data, but no one sees it as being a credible source. Now, on the other hand, if we've got, you know, this really high quality National Geographic level design, but the data is bad, we end up in this even worse place, which is the misleading but believable category. And my goal in life and in my work, um, and often the goal in self-service analytics, is to help people target this sweet spot of good design and good data analytics and representation, where we can go straight to the process of seeing and understanding spatial data and not be distracted by poor designer data. And this requires understanding a bit about how people understand maps. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of what you should never do, because this was always, at least when I was teaching college classes, this is one of the things my students loved. Let's talk about the bad maps, because these kinds of Cardo blunders actually happen all the time. And I've got some really extreme examples I'll show you before we dig into you know, what, what makes it a better map. Um, this particularly interesting mess was, was actually a special map made for me by one of my master's students uh, many years ago. And she was trying to see how many horrible things she could do in one map. And I think she did really well at making something that's information rich. I mean, this is this is has you know five different attributes with you know a bunch of symbolization methods. Most of them are totally inappropriate. Um, it's just not a great map. Um, and to me, the best part about this is when I asked her where Idaho went, and she she blushed and said she didn't actually realize that she accidentally deleted it in her attempt to make this horrible specimen. Um, and by the way, I mean, this was totally intentional. And I will point out um, the, the woman who made this for me, she's now a professor at Georgia Tech. And I think she actually knows what she's doing with maps um, and was thinking very carefully about how to make a bad one. And you know, more often than not, though, I mean, the, the, the strange and bad maps we find aren't actually intentional, like these two. Um, one I just picked up very recently um, off of Twitter, where someone was posting this map from BBC World. Um, and it turns out that they do have Sweden labeled, and that is not Sweden, it's actually Finland. And one of the arch uh, great maps from my archives on the right, uh, you know, this is a CNN map that, you know, they were very much trying hard to do the right thing. And uh, they have labeled Switzerland, which is also known as the Czech Republic, 
This was sent to me by a Swiss colleague as why cartographers are still in business. But fortunately, um, you know, in the self-service analytics landscape, uh, we actually make it really difficult to make some of those sorts of maps. And I think, you know, with respect to the current landscape, um, you know, I think we've got this, we're at this really interesting point where, you know, mapping is expected in a lot of visualization products. Um, you know, for instance, you know, we've got a lot of map design and analysis functions built into products like Tableau and Cardo and Esri's ArcGIS online product, just to name a few. Yeah, we've made it so that anybody who wants to make a map can, and there are the tools to make it really easy. So you've got spatial data, you have full cartographic license, go forth, do some spatial magic. But you know, my experience um, you know, as both an educator and you know, now an in industry is that no matter how carefully we design mapping software or how clever we get with trying to help people do the right thing, there are a lot of significant hurdles to helping people feel confident that they've done the right things with data and that their map design is really going to be useful. And personally, um, you know, I think that you know, while good software can help with this, it will never eliminate the need for us to think critically about map data and map design. So because you know, we know that no matter how good the software is, yeah, we still have problems. And one of those big problems is that, um, you know, I look at the fact that all maps are wrong and they can be wrong in some interesting kind of spectacular ways. Um, at least, yeah, I would say they're kind of awesome, at least if you enjoy some of the weirdness of geography. But I would say maps are still really useful and they help us understand the world around us and they're important. When I think about the big picture challenges of you know, how people think about maps and some of the, the trust problems that come up in the analytics challenges, you know, it really boils down to me is you know, this big picture that our visual systems are tuned to make sense of distributions, whether it's in the real world or in scaled representations like maps. We pick up on colors, we pick up on patterns. You know, we're really good at this. But unfortunately, the patterns that we pick up on aren't always what was intended when we're talking about maps. And some of this is the problem of what I'd call real world versus map, which is that you know, we're used to living in the real world and have an expectation for how the three-dimensional world around us works. And we assume that that just naturally translates into map form as we understand it. But we have to step back and think about the fact that we've simplified in our data collection. We've selected out the bits and the level of detail that are important to us. We've squished the real world into these digital bits and bytes in a computer. And then we're selectively simplifying even more in order to make a coherent map that tells the story that we want. And when we think about the implications of this simplification, we also have to consider that we aren't just dealing with how you as an individual have simplified things. We're dealing with the data collectors, the map makers, all of their understanding and expectation for how the world works and what they see as being sufficiently important to represent on the map. So with that becomes there are quite a few places for noise to creep into the system. So now I'm gonna to move to this totally interactive virtual part of the presentation where I want you to take a look at this map and I haven't given you a title I haven't given you a legend. I'm gonna give you like 30 more seconds to stare at this and try and figure out what this is. And I want you to do your best and type into the chat, which I can now see, what do you think this is? And you know, if you feel really excited, you know, feel free to either just yell it at your computer too, because everybody um, who can hear you at home is probably gonna think you're totally nuts and having a great time at your, your meetings today. Um, but I want you to think about what might this be? because I think it's an example of how we can intuitively make sense of maps. Oh, I'm already seeing croplands has showed up. Oh, drought, drought is good. Um, color scheme might be good for drought because the first important step in thinking about how people think about maps is to identify how good we are at naturally identifying patterns and matching them up to other bits of information we have in our head. Oh, I've got COVID-19, I've got population and population density, map coverage, maybe this is like where we have like really great LIDAR data, um, unavailability of good coffee, that, that's a particularly good one. 
um, Mississippi watershed because we've got this big stripe of dark data right down the middle. And you know what? Since somebody had just typed in religious affiliation, I will just go ahead and switch to the next map because this is the first time that anybody has ever gotten this right. Um, so this is a data set from the Association of Religion Data Archives. And it shows, yeah, good job, Alan, good job. Um, it shows the number of religious adherents per thousand people for each county. So why did I wanna use this map? I love this as a map example because if you step back and think about what you were doing when you were interpreting this map, you went into these very intuitive, how do we read a map problems? How did you decode the patterns? We're finding clusters. So we're looking for where are there groups of light things, groups of dark things. We're looking at high value, low value types of relationships. The color scheme that was on here, because it was this sequential color scheme from light values to dark values, has intuitive meaning to people. Light values tend to mean less stuff dark values tend to mean more stuff. And actually point out, that's really if you're using a light colored base map. If you were to use like a really cool dark, like a black base map, you actually switch that. It's really looking at how much contrast there is between the colors and the map. And so there's a lot that we can assume and just start running with reading a, visual, a visualization and matching it up with other characteristics that we know about in the world. Um, and this is really important. I mean, if I had screwed with these um, visual cues, you know, if I had switched it so that light was the high values and dark were the low values, you would probably have a different set of things that you might identify. You might have different guesses about what this data set is. Or if I didn't use, um, you know, a single color ramp, you know, I used like individual blues and reds and greens and purples, you might have seen a different pattern as well. I mean, just in case anybody was looking at the legend, and I will tell you, most people do not read the legends on maps. Um, if anybody caught the fact that the highest values are greater than 1,000 per 1,000, is actually not a mistake in the data. Because this is county level data, you have this artifact where this is religious adherence. So people may be driving across county boundaries in order to go to their, their church or temple, um, synagogue of choice. They may... Um, they may be traveling. And so you may not get counted in the, the, the place where you, um, where you live. You may also get counted more than once. Um, you know, I know quite a few people who live in houses where they alternate which church they go to on Sundays because different religious uh, values in the family and they've compromised. So sometimes you have multi counts. So let's take a different step, uh, a step in a different direction and look at interpretability. Um, so this is a really legitimate USGS map. I harvested this from, from the internet because the internet has great things if you look far enough. Um, someone thought that this map was a really good idea back in 1990. So this is old and it's just still just a great map and it is very bright and it might make your eyes burn if you look at it for too long. And there's a legend on this. I have hidden it from you. Um, now I want you to try and logic out something about this map. Uh, what states are the highest water users? So this is domestic fresh water use. Um, and remember, it's 1990, so you've got to you know, take your way back machine and think about what the answer should be for 1990. Um, feel free to just take a guess, yell it at your computer screen, or type it in. What color is the highest water use? I see greens, I see reds, I see a couple of reds coming in. Oh, cyan, blue. Yeah, if, this, if we were all in the room together, I would hear every color being yelled out. And so there are a number of people that have said red and included some detail. Like I see Lauren just said, you know, red, California, Texas, Florida, agriculture. Yeah, those are states that use a lot of water, but they have some other important characteristics that we'll talk about. Now, when we think about, um, how we would read this map, did it match with what you expected? Was it easy to figure out what the colors meant? Um, you know, my guess is for the person who was making this map, it may have been completely intuitive uh, because they were really close to the data. But for me, I have a really hard time figuring out if yellow is more than bright blue or bright green. I can't make a whole lot of just natural sense of this. So, Let's step back from this and just talk about kind of some general rules of thumb. And then we're gonna come back to that map and talk about interpretation a little bit more. So as a rule of thumb, I mean, there are some basic guidelines that are gonna carry you through in most decisions. 
because you, know, you want to try and match up your map with how people just intuitively understand things. And this is something that we do all the time in self-service analytics environments. You know, we are consciously thinking about how to make it hard for you to violate some, some good guidelines for matching human intuition with color meaning, for instance. I mean, it's always possible, but, and I do it all the time to make bad maps, so it's totally possible. Um, but we start with helpful suggestions based on what we're seeing in your data. Do you have numeric data? Does it have a natural break point? That's really interesting. How can we help you make a good first guess? So just as some examples, if you're working with numeric data, you want to show relationships from more to less. You typically use a color scheme with a strong light to dark continuum. Or you're going to use for point locations, things like size to show the relationships from more to less. Less stuff, smaller symbol. More stuff, larger symbol. Or if you have numeric data that has an inflection point of interest, you know, maybe positive and negative values, or you want to be able to emphasize values above or below um, national average or something else that's interesting to you in the data, you use things like these diverging color schemes. Um, and those allow people to emphasize not just more or less, but which side of an inflection point. Essentially, you're taking that, that um, top data set you know, or those top color examples of you know, light color to dark color, and you're just taking two of them and stacking them on top of each other. So there are some good things that you can do to try and make just the general interpretation of value easier. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, if you're working with things like categorical data, you want to be careful to not imply any numerical relationships. So none of that more or less that we have with the light and dark values. We just want to show different. And so we use those with distinct colors or hues or shapes. Um, you know, occasionally there are going to be examples where you do use light and dark versions of the same color, um, such as if you have several color, uh, several categories of forest, like I have here, sparse forest might be a lighter green and um, dense forest might be a darker green. Um, you just try and generally match those shades with the relevant attribute of the category. So let's go back to our original water map and, and talk about applying some basic intuitive symbolization. So it's a lot more imp in, uh, informative to just make a map that looks like, you know, the big version here. We've got intuitive symbolization with light blue for low usage, dark blue for high usage, and we're using blue as our color choice because semantically it, you know, it makes some sense with our topic of water. I um, mean, you know, it's often a good choice to use colors that align with topics, um, but I do feel like I need to put this disclaimer in because when I would talk about this with students, invariably someone would make a map um, that led me to have the talk about color. And that talk often involved around thinking about sometimes it's not appropriate to use colors that you personally might semantically associate with things. And the example that we always came back to was please never use a flesh tones color scheme to make a map of racial distributions. Um, that's my public service announcement for today. You're never going to get that right. Please don't go there. So moving on, you know, I'm going to step back to consider some of the problems with the underlying data and why that map of water usage that I cleaned up is still a really bad map. And I've seen a couple comments about this that came up in the chat. So I know there are already some folks that are thinking about this. Um, and one of the things to, to, to think about is the most important point about making a map, when you're designing a map, you're often the expert in that data set. And you can see things and know things about the data more intuitively than just about anybody else, because everybody else has spent less time staring at the data. And we just get the map to make sense of things and tend to believe what's on the map. And it doesn't always show us what we think it's going to show us. So when we make a map like this, it ends up telling us something about water use. That's true. But it's also tremendously useless. I mean, what does it really tell me? It tells me that California, Texas, Florida, New York have the highest water use. But something that all of those states have in common, think about that for a second, or go back and read through the chat, because a couple of people have already pointed that out. But keep that question in the back of your mind as I show you a few more examples. Um, here's a little diversion example, um, because this is one of my favorite XKCD comics. And I feel pretty confident that you've all seen maps that are about as informative of any of the three in this comic. You may have even made them. I mean, I know that I have, and it often takes a minute to think and step back and realize that it's not really showing an informative spatial pattern. And then you have to think about how can I fix this to actually show somebody 
interesting information about my data. Or here's a more real world example from the National Park Service. And I think that this is really a beautiful map. I think it's captivating. It's the kind of thing where I wish that I had come up with the idea to make this because I think it's really neat. Um, you know, in this example, the Park Service used magical computer algorithms um, to map a soundscape of the United States where yellow is louder and blue is quieter. And while I think this is a really cool project and is a really nice looking map, it's really just telling me where people live because it turns out, and I know this is gonna be like super shocking, but it tends to be louder where there are more people. So when we go back to our water map, you know, it brings up that problem of the original map was really just showing us where the people were. And when you're making maps that maybe are just raw count data, like total number of gallons, you should think about whether you need to normalize or standardize your data. In other words, you think about how your data might need to be adjusted so that it isn't just a reflection of region size, of population, or something else that's really giving you a map that has no real added value. You know, and that might mean you use an area-based measure like people per square mile, or a population-based measure, um, cases per 100,000, or using another variable to make it so that you can actually make fair comparisons between locations. Because I think the map on the bottom here where we look at water use per capita shows us a very interesting and very different pattern where um, as Alan has pointed out in the chat, because I am, I am trying to watch that. I see, I see you, Alan, I've got my eye on you. Um, Again, we see Utah. Apparently there's just always something interesting happening in Utah. And in 1990, Utah was using a lot more water per capita. So population maps, um, just to kind of sum it up, you know, they're interesting, um, but they're often not useful unless your point is really just to show where people live. So let's look at a slightly different problem. Um, even if you're using a carefully selected appropriately normalized attribute, you need to consider how the data will be interpreted and ask what the story is that you want to tell. Um, you know, not so big mapping secret is that most of your map readers are not going to spend much time actually looking at your beautiful, carefully crafted legend. They're going to look at the map, use some intuition and say, ooh, ooh, more stuff over here, less stuff over here. I totally know what's going on. Map pattern is sorted out. So the choices you make with how you assign these shades to values makes a significant difference in observed pattern. So take, for instance, these three maps that show the percent poverty in the United States. On the left, we have a continuous color ramp. So that's just the shades are based on actual value. So for 2,000 counties, we might have 2,000 unique shades. You know, granted, you can't perceive that many different shades. You know, you're really probably picking up, you know, like maybe seven to 11 different shades of blue but it still shows a continuous ramp based on value and our eyes can average it out into patterns of more stuff and less stuff. Now in the middle map, we have four different shades and they're determined by equal intervals. And so these are equal intervals on the number line. So each shade represents the same distance on the number line, say like zero to 10%, 10 to 20%, 20 to 30%, for instance. Well, on the right, we have four shades again, but they're determined by quantiles so that each shade on the map is approximately the same number of counties. So top 25%, bottom 25%, and then our two categories with those two middle 25% categories. I want to show these maps because they are exactly the same data, but the pattern might be interpreted very differently. And this is where, you know, in some ways, ethical decision-making comes into play with cartography. You know, you are trying to tell a story, but you need to think about what that story is and whether or not you need to allow people to make their own stories and dig into the data to figure out what is in there that is more than just the story that you're telling. So with these three maps, for instance, if I were arguing for more services for a low income population, I'm probably going to pick the map on the right because we see larger areas that have dark or high values, which is going to imply we have more, more large we have more population areas that we need to address. If I were arguing against funding for more services, I'd probably go with the map in the middle where we see larger areas with lighter low values suggesting there isn't much of a problem, but the data is exactly the same. It's just the pattern that we perceive that varies. And this is a big cartographic license issue. 
I mean, there's nothing that says you can't put the class breaks anywhere you want. So you could adjust until you see the pattern you want, um, because we know that a lot of people aren't really going to read the legend. And I would say, while it's totally slimy to just adjust the visual until it's the most convincing, it isn't unheard of for people to do that. Ideally, though, um, when you're picking class breaks or bins for your numeric data, you know, you're going into this with a question in mind. You have an idea of why certain class breaks are relevant. And the default is generally not the right answer. So if, for instance, you use ArcGIS, and I used, I used Esri's GIS products for a long time, and the default classification scheme was always natural breaks, which sounds really good. Oh, it's natural breaks. It's you know thinking about my data. It's doing something smart. But it may not be the right answer for the question that you're trying to get at or how you want to explore your data. And so this becomes both a critical data consumption question and um, like a map reader question. You need to think about whether this is really, you know, the class breaks are really helping you understand the pattern that you're interested in. And you need to ask if you trust the map and you need to ask if those class breaks make sense. Because uh, you know, somebody point out confirmation bias, absolutely. Because if you find the pattern that you want, you may just stop thinking about your data. Oh, look, problem solved. But there may be more interesting things in your data set. And I would say there are pretty much infinite ways to break up your data. And each of them is likely to give you a very different visual pattern. Uh, people often ask me, what is the best one? How do I pick the best one? And this is where that cartographic license comes into play. Um, I often say make multiple maps and think about how they're different and what the story is and think about what's really in your data. And then think about which one works for the story you're trying to tell or what patterns you're trying to explore with your data. And then you can get creative with symbolization to emphasize the story. Um, for instance, the map on the right where it has the highest value counties in a color that really jumps off the map and then shows the rest of the distribution in these gray tones that kind of fade into the background a little bit more that help you see the rest of the story, but still allow you to emphasize this like single high value in the story. Um, or, you know, you can go, kind of go crazy with it. I mean, my suggestion is that if you really know your data well, you think about what interesting hand holds or maybe eye holds would be helpful for map readers to help them see patterns and help them understand why these patterns or what you have done with the data to break it up in specific ways, help them interpret. So here, for instance, I knew in this example, I wanted to show how counties compared to national average. So I calculated out that value, created my own diverging classification scheme so I could see counties above that and below that. So above national average is in the um, orange shades and below is in the, the gray and blue. And then I added some annotation to the legend. So it was clear, not just that we had this break point to show us, you know, kind of more um, higher values, more lower values, but I can communicate to people who are reading this map why I picked that. And they may agree with it, they may disagree with it, but at least they have enough information to really understand why. So I want to move on a little bit because I've just talked about some of the visual analysis with maps, but I want to also talk about some of the spatial analytics that happens under the hood and what this means for how people understand maps and the data that goes into them. So a lot of the analytics problems I deal with are related to map projections, um, because this is just an area that I'm particularly interested in and that, that has a lot of really interesting cognitive science problems in it. You know, it's thinking about how do we, in our minds, translate from this 3D Earth model into a two-dimensional flat paper map model. And this is one of my favorite problem areas. And it often leads to so much confusion with how people understand spatial data and how spatial analysis can go wrong. And I'm gonna start with, um, to, to demonstrate the problem, this is what I like to call the floating homes crime spree issues of Seattle. Um, if you haven't been to Seattle, or maybe even if you have visited, you might not know, uh, we have a lot of houseboats on our local lakes. And so let's say, you know, let's say you were exploring Seattle and you wanted to know something about crime distribution and patterns, and you think this is spatial data. Great, I'm gonna get a data set of crime. I'm gonna start to dig in and explore. I'm gonna learn a bit about it. It's gonna be great. Um, this is a really common request that we get for analytics tools like Tableau. You know, I have a table of data, how can I analyze it? And we see tables like this. Um, and this gets at this really great problem of how people think about space. 
and how we represent space and where a problem comes up in the middle. Because this table has latitude and longitude. I can put that on a map, no problem. But it comes to the fundamental problem that people have with spatial data. And that is that we may not be talking about the same location. And that's weird um, because people have this concept of latitude and longitude as this exact thing. But if we don't know some details about that, we may have problems. So I use this all the time at work. Um, and I love breaking it out whenever the maps team is, is you know, working on something like I break out one of my, my problem data sets that I've made. I say, so I've dropped my data onto the map. Let's start talking about patterns. You know, this is a crime data set. We have a lot of houseboats in Seattle. Um, you, know, you can see some of the docks on this map. I put an arrow to show you, you know, here are the docks, here are all of these points. Um, it turns out that there's just a lot of crime that's happening out on these docks. But it also turns out that this pattern is completely fake. But how would you know that if you're in data exploration mode or you just downloaded this data somewhere and it's got some latitude and longitude and that's all the information that you get. It turns out this particular data set, and you know, I will probably be speaking to the, um, the nerdy map projection side of you right now for about 10 seconds. This particular data set uses the North American datum of 1927, but Software that just sees latitude and longitude often has to make a guess. And there are often these under the hood assumptions. Tableau, for instance, assumes that if it just sees latitude and longitude with no coordinate reference system, it's WGS 84. And I see that the devil is in the datums. That is absolutely right. And if you were at Tableau and you wanted to, to join the maps team and be on our bike to work uh, month team, you would get to be a datum shifter because that is our cool. Um, mapping bike team name. But what should the data really look like? Um, if you knew that the latitude and longitude were actually um, NAD27, your software can do that shift for you. Um, if the data were correctly defined in WGS84, it lines up perfectly and you no longer have a huge like houseboat crime issue. But let's take a step back to how people understand this. And that's where the problem is. People think about things like latitude and longitude as this absolute like, oh, that's a location. But if you don't understand the model that was built on, you have a problem. And so when you see a data set, if you go into it with this idea of, I'm just gonna accept whatever the data has shown me and therefore it's gonna be right, you often get patterns that aren't actually right. And so there's this, this level of hypothesis testing that we have to really encourage people to do. But I'm going to go to some other levels of complexity, um, because it isn't just the points we deal with. Um, these points are used for other things. You know, for instance, we, we might want to aggregate them. And this is you know, one of the examples near and dear to my heart. It's spatial binning, um, like hex bins, because they're cool, they're hip, they're edgy. Um, you know, we can take dense point data sets, like um, on the right, I have taxi cab pickup locations in Manhattan. And there's so much data that you know, we, can't, we can't make sense of it just looking at the raw point locations. But if we aggregate it into things like hex bins, we can start to see a pattern much more clearly. At least in theory, you know, we can use things like these nice regular bins to solve a great visual analysis challenge. Um, we've got a lot of dense data. We need a way to simplify it. We need a way to help you know, make sense of it in the world. But in order to do that, um, we're making some false assumptions about how the data works on the flat map. And those assumptions aren't necessarily true in the real world. So I'm going to show an extreme example with spatial bins. And here I've got a nice set of you know, regularly sized, regularly shaped hexagons that cover the entire Earth. And we're going to bin a data set of randomly distributed points into those hexagons um, to understand how it changes across space. It's a really nice idea. We've got a regular grid. We can clearly see that these are the same size. We can clearly see that they are the same shape. Perfect for aggregating our data to look at distributions. And this is what we get. So I have distributed, you know, I put the hex bins on top of a point data set. And this really is a random data set that I made. And we can clearly see a pattern in it. Uh, the distribution of data is much heavier around the equator, and it gets lighter as we get close to the poles. Problem solved. I've analyzed my distribution. I have the answer. I can move on with my work. But we have this huge disconnect here. And that's that our eyes see regular hexagons. They're the same size. They're the same shape. They are equal. 
but they aren't because our eyes and our brains are thinking about planar math and the map is dealing with spherical data. And this is a really common problem. Um, it's an area I've done quite a bit of research on and have found that there's this really cool problem where people can often recognize distortion in map projections, especially with the common base map used in web maps. They can say, oh, that's Web Mercator. And Web Mercator or the Mercator projection in general distorts things, distorts area more as you move away from the equator. Um, I know that this is wrong. And then you ask them to solve a problem using data on the Web Mercator, like estimate the area of something or tell me about the distribution. And they can tell you exactly what is on the map. So one side of their brain is saying, it's distorted. I know it's distorted, lots of area distortion. Greenland's a great example. Now I need to solve a problem with this map. It's on a map, it's on the plane. There is no distortion. I can answer the question. We actually are very bad at making sense of what's happening in projected space. Um, just to put in context how much difference there is between these bins, um, at the equator, these particular bins are about 819,000 square kilometers, and up closer to the poles, they're about 9,700 square kilometers. And so even though our eyes see them as the same, really what's happening in this pattern is that the bins are covering a much smaller and smaller ground area, and so they hold a lot fewer points. So if somebody was just trying to interpret this, um, you know, they might say, I see the pattern, more stuff at the equator, less stuff near the poles, pattern done. But because we're not able to make that um, automatic calculation in our minds about what's really happening, we get a false pattern. And a lot of people make these maps and do bad, bad, bad things with them. Um, just to put it in context, here's an example where I've taken some bins that are actually the same approximate size on the sphere. This is a set of data from a guy named Kevin Saar who's at Oregon State University. And these are something he calls the icosahedral Snyder equal area bins. He does a lot of work on discrete global grid systems. So if I put those onto the base map, you can clearly see how their area gets distorted. And when we use those to bin the point data using exactly the same color scheme, um, you can see that the distribution is roughly equal across the Earth's surface. It gives us a very different pattern. But people often don't trust that pattern because these bins don't then look like they are the same size and the same shape. And it causes this really crazy mental disconnect. Um, just if by chance you want to know more about this, um, I wrote a paper a number of years ago with uh, Mike Finn, who was at the US Geological Survey at the time, and Dan Streeby, who's one of the um, principal engineers on our maps team at Tableau. They're two of my favorite um, map projection collaborators. And we wrote a paper that has the top, it is my favorite uh, title that I have any paper I've written, um, Shapes on a Plane. And uh, I've been heard it described as surprisingly readable, which I think is a compliment for an academic publication. Um, so if you're interested in some of the challenges on this, including if you want to be able to calculate out, um, because you want to use hex bins, what is the largest geographic area that you can use for your hex bins and not have some perceptual problems, we do have the equations in there. Um, and I think it's, it's really a fun paper. And you can get that from our research website at Tableau if you're curious. Just to carry it a little bit further, um, you know, it isn't just hex bins that have this kind of problem. Um, we see the same problem on heat maps as well. And people love heat maps and they love to do them at the global scale. But I want to show you uh, the same problem just in a different context. How would you calculate something like point density for a heat map? Um, you have to choose. Are you calculating in screen coordinates or are you calculating in spherical coordinates? And most systems calculate in screen coordinates. So let's take a look. Um, you know, here's a nice cluster of points near the equator. Here's that exact same data set that I just rotated uh, up a little bit higher on the sphere. And we go from a nice single hot spot, the equator, to five individual hot spots. You know, we can see these together on the same map, and they're clearly different patterns. So what would be the valid assessment that someone might make of the pattern? Well, what their eyes tell them is there's a large cluster near South America and then some distributed smaller clusters farther north. But the pattern is really that these are exactly the same density. The other choice that you would have in making this map is you could take the, that cluster up near Greenland and turn it into the hotspot of doom because it would be like this huge giant hotspot, which visually would then draw somebody's eye and 
you get a similar misreading. Um, but the similar misreading is that now we have this giant, super important hotspot and this little tiny, less important hotspot. And that's also an incorrect assumption. Some other interesting places where there are conflicts and how we think about space are in basic issues like drawing lines, like what is the shortest path between two points? Um, I've got an example of the line between Los Angeles Airport and Heathrow Airport in two different ways here. You could draw it as a straight line to connect those points or as a great circle route where you actually see the shortest path. And these confuse people quite a bit because we learned in math back in the day that the shortest point or shortest distance between two lines or two points is a straight line. It's not this weird curvy line. And that's weird. Um, one thing I'll point out that we do in Tableau is if you want to draw this line between two points, we actually do give you the great elliptic arc by default and we calculate distances along that great elliptic arc. So we're giving you the real data, but people don't always trust it. So here are a couple examples of maps that um, people have sent me just in the last month where we had to have a conversation about what was correct on these maps. And the first thing I can point out is that, well, these are just straight lines between the maps. So you need to use the, the make line function in Tableau and get the great circle uh, or the great elliptic arc. So that's the first issue. And then once we get through the, let's get the calculation right problem, I get these questions about, but why does the line go the wrong way? It's totally going the wrong way around the earth. And sometimes people think it's going the wrong way around the earth because aesthetically, they do not like that now they have this line that goes maybe off to the left of the map and then comes back on the right side of the map because this is what happens when you're talking about a planar map versus the actual sphere where things really can just go around the circle or around the sphere. You know, On the map, you go to the periphery and then you come back on the other side. And so having this conversation about, but the line is clearly wrong. The path is not right because it's you know ugly on my map. And this is, this is really a weird problem that comes up quite a bit. Now I teach people the math to calculate intermediate points so that they can get their path to go a different direction. But I make sure that they tell me that they know that this is not the shortest path. This is just an aesthetic thing that they're doing. But it isn't just thinking about lines, because there are a lot of derivative calculations that come through when we think about like weird ways that we think about distances. And this is a nice example um, that I picked up from a professor at the University of Zurich a few years ago. She caught this in the newspaper, and they were showing, um, they were measuring concentric circles on the map to show how far missiles could travel from North Korea. And this is a really interesting idea. Um, and we know that, you know, and on the plane, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So I should just be able to take, you know, take my, my compass out and draw a couple circles. But it's actually really incorrect. And sadly, I get new examples of this quite regularly. Um, this, is, this is one from just last year. Uh, it was a Twitter thread from this woman, Joanna Merson. And she was talking about the errors that people were making when they were trying to put the really horrific explosion in Beirut into context. And she very nicely and graphically demonstrated, you can't just draw a circular blast area and then move that to other places on the map and have it maintain the same meaning because map projections don't work that way. Just to, to give you know, the real context of how much of a difference is this really, uh, this is an example of that map from the Zurich newspaper and what that largest buffer would look like if you were calculating the buffer correctly. So this is how we would calculate the buffer in Tableau where we're doing all of the calculations on the ellipsoid. And so you don't have that circular buffer, but you have this thing that doesn't look like what people often expect when they say, I just want to measure the same distance out around this point. You have to take into consideration the distortion. And so we have to periodically suspend our beliefs of how distance works on a planar map and accept how it works on the ellipsoid and then is projected. So just kind of a, a concluding note on map projections. I always get the question of, you know, map projections cause problems. We go from 3D world into 2D planar world. Why don't we just use a better projection? And that is because there is no unicorn map projection that solves all of our problems. 
you know, in self-service analytics, you know, we've picked Web Mercator as the base map that we use. And there are a lot of reasons behind that. And I am happy to, to talk about those. I've written some papers about it. Um, it's an area that's really interesting to me. But I get a lot of questions as well about whatever the, the latest map projection unicorn suggestion is that's making the round on the media. Someone has invented this new, um, new projection that is equal area and better than everything else. And yay. Uh, but it's actually not solving our problems either. And this is, this is probably the other paper in my top two papers I've ever written. I just wrote a paper called The Unicorn of Map Projections, which talks about this specific problem, which is that we really want a single projection to solve all of our problems, but we don't have it. And so we have to ask very consciously, how do we do work in a spherical world and in a planar world to make sure that it is understandable? So just a few take home messages, um, because I think these are, are you know, particularly important points, you know, especially as people who probably spend a lot of time thinking about data that has a spatial component. You need to be very careful when you're doing your exploratory analysis or trying to create a visualization that other people will be using to think about how other people may see your map and put yourself in their shoes and say, are they gonna find patterns that aren't here? Am I using symbolization that's intuitive to them? Can they, can they really see the pattern that's important here? Or are they gonna to have to work pretty hard for it? Because you're very close to your data and people who are looking at the maps that you produce are probably not as familiar. And so it's gonna take more effort for them to find patterns unless you really help them. I'd also say that um, you know, it's important to not trust everything you see because any map that was created or any data set that was created has been created generally by a person or with the intervention of a person, somebody who's making decisions about sampling rates, generalization, the numeric values that have been collected. Um, and you need to dig into what is really behind this data set. It's also important to read the manual and know very well how analytics work. I mean, this is something I'm particularly proud of, of the work that we do in Tableau in that we're very clear in how we do analytics and we want people to understand it. And we want them to understand all of the places where we're making decisions that may be contrary to what they think should happen with data, but that is actually correct because we're doing work in, you know, on the ellipsoid. And then finally, um, you know, I just wanna leave you with the point that I think it's important that you take any of the knowledge that you have about maps and data and how they work to help other people understand the challenges of spatial data so that they can use spatial data effectively. Because I think it's a responsibility that we have of people who are in geo fields. And you know, as somebody who has quite a few degrees in geography um, and has often been confused with people who have quite a few degrees in geology, I see us as all kind of kin folk that are in the same boat of, of the geo world. So hopefully you can help me with, with some of these challenges. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop um, and again, you know, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, you know, it's really been quite nice. And uh, I'm glad you guys were uh, active in the chat. It's always nice to get a little bit of interactivity, um, even if I can't see all of you. Um, if you have questions, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. I'll let um, Bill uh, guide that and let me know how much time we actually have. Um, and if you do have questions that we can't get to, please um, feel free to reach out over email or you can find me on, on Twitter. Um, my handle is Maps Overlord. And occasionally I check LinkedIn, but I'm really bad at it. So um, I like connect, connect to all of my links in like a batch once a week. But anyway, if you have questions, I'm happy to field them um, and I'm happy to talk afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. As, as Doug put in the comments, if people have questions, uh, use the chat or raise your hand. We we'd actually do have a 10 minute break scheduled after this. Uh, so if you want to get up and grab a glass of water, a cup of coffee or pet your dog or something, that's great. If you want to stay and ask questions and Sarah has time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure happy to stay and answer questions uh, on the chat or, uh, or live. I'll, I'll just say I thought that was a really outstanding presentation about a lot of important topics. Uh, sometimes when people will ask me, you know, what were the most important classes you took to prepare you for career, your career? And I'll always include cartography. I took cartography in, I think, 1979 at the University of Idaho. Uh, and still this said is probably one of the top couple of courses I ever took, uh, along with photojournalism and 20th century German literature. 
time. And then I somehow stumbled into geology, uh, but it was really outstanding. I'll check our records, but that may have been the first time anybody in a KGS presentation has mentioned furry pornography consumption. Uh, so <laughs> they may have a first there. And uh, this is but, what happens when you let the geographers in. Well, there was an intentional act. We, we wanted people to, to think, uh, think provocatively and in a little bit different way than we often do. So I'll uh, turn over the floor to people who want to ask questions. I think uh, Kegel has a question. Or she has a right hand raised. I do. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you so much for that talk, Sarah. Um, super interesting. So I'm not a geologist either. I am a rhetorician, um, and I do rhetoric of science and technology and work with folks at KGS. So this is like super up my alley. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is if you have folks at Tableau who work. <laughs> oh, there goes the dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who have training in like technical or visual communication or design. Okay, I'm gonna mute. Um, we have a ton of people that work in um, you know, technical and cognitive aspects and visualization and design. Actually, a good portion of our research team is exactly in that space. Um, so our research team, we have about 10 people and I'm gonna say eight of the 10 are very active in um, information visualization communities. I'm the only one, I'm, I'm like the token non-computer scientist. So I think about things from a geography and psychology cognitive science perspective, but other people on the team are really engaged with thinking about everything from crazy new visualizations you've never seen before and how they might help or hinder us to you know, even the, the, the mundane everyday aspects of how do we do pie charts better? And so this is, this is really an area that, that we do quite a bit at. And if you're interested, I could point you to some of the things that, that folks on the team have been working on. Um, or actually, you could just look at the research.tableau.com website. We put our published papers up there. And there are a number of things that people have been working on that might be, might be interesting. And you know, we're always happy to talk as well. We're, we're, we're researchers. We love to talk to people. Actually, we are like the most introverted group at Tableau. Um, but we love email. I think there's a there's a few questions in the chat. Um, one from Marty Paris or KGS. Do you know if global circulation models used by the climate community have appropriate corrections so that results are not spatially distorted? Ooh, that's that's probably getting into something that's a little too much on the fringe of what I actively work with and know. Um, I would probably have to go in and start reading some of the metadata in terms of what they're doing. Um, one of the things that I found is that a lot of the, the, the global community data, because the data is collected um, by satellite sensors or other things that are really carefully tracking the coordinate reference systems, there is often a lot more attention to thinking about how it is collected. Um, we then have some problems that come up with derivative analytics that are done and ensuring that people are doing analytics using the original data in appropriate um, projected coordinate systems or just doing it in spherical coordinates, as well as then how that data gets visualized. I mean, this, is, this goes back to the, the problem that there's no unicorn map projection. And when we're talking about things like global patterns, it is really hard to come up with the best projection um, because it's gonna depend on whether area-based patterns are really critical for what people need to interpret or whether angular relationships are really important or distances are really important. Um, and just as uh, a note, in case people really wanna um, kind of geek out on this, I wrote a book um, about a year ago, I think is when it came out with a colleague named Fritz Kessler at Penn State University. And it was designed, it's, it's a book called Working with Map Projections. And it's all about thinking about how people understand data as it's represented and how to think about how to pick a map projection that's gonna be appropriate for the specific map type that you're trying to make to try and minimize those problems with an eye to the fact that there is no perfect map projection, but helping you understand what some of those trade-offs are. Um, so I think, I think it's a useful book and we wrote it to reach out to the non-geography audiences because you, know, you really shouldn't have, have to have a PhD in, in geographic information science to be able to use the right map projection. That's great. Um, I'm gonna check that out. Uh, and actually sort of maybe sort of related is, so how do you, another question in the chat was from Jufeng Zhu here at KGS. How do you explain 
the North Korean missile map to people who don't think the map to the right, the, the, um, the non-circle one um, doesn't, doesn't look right. And so the way, the way that I generally approach that is, uh, it, it depends on the person that I'm explaining it to, but Google Earth actually comes in pretty handy. Um, and while I don't think that you know a, a digital globe is the best way to visualize data, because there's still a lot of having to mentally translate that, um, you know, kind of mentally stitch different views together, um, Google Earth does give you an opportunity to draw something that looks very circular to people, and then to think about, you know, let's look at different points on the circle and where they correspond to those same locations on the projected map. Um, another way that you can do it without something like Google Earth is using an orthographic projection or using an equidistant projection and you know showing this is what the pattern looks like when we can render this buffer as a perfect circle. And let's look at those points and match them up to what it looks like on a different map projection. Those are some of the tricks that I use um, generally, but I'll say you know, map projections are really hard because we do have two minds about them. People often understand that maps distort space areas, angles, distances, directions, but translating that into how to mentally compensate for it is very hard. Um, even people that I think are you know, experts in the map projection field often have a difficult time just doing that in their head to understand patterns. Great, um, well, thank you. Uh, we have any more questions? Um, Somebody did ask if we're recording this and we are recording it and um, we'll make it available on YouTube. So, or I think our YouTube, but um, so. Um, well, we're in a break now. If, if there's no other questions, we'll, we'll take a break for about four more minutes um, and then we'll reconvene here with um, Dr. Casey's talk at um, 125. Yeah, and Douglas is Bill. I just want to say thank you again to Sarah. I know you have another commitment, but feel free to stay around as, as long as you'd like. Uh, I do want to mention people, one of the good things about Zoom is that Sarah actually had another speaking commitment today. And if it weren't for doing this virtually, she would have not been able to, to be here to speak to us today. So there are some good things to come out of this strange virtual year we've had. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best to hit all the time zones in any given week. Um, and, and the one, the one really sad thing is I think that when I originally talked with Bill about this, he said that when you guys meet in person, sometimes there's, there's barbecue and, and fun stuff. And that made me really sad because as somebody who, I used to live in South Carolina and I was a certified barbecue judge. Um, I really miss sampling the barbecue of the U.S. because it's really good. And so I would have loved to have had that opportunity. <laughs> We've also been known to, to have locally made bourbon ice cream too. That would also be lovely. So I am looking forward to, to getting to, to Kentucky one of yeah, these we'll, days we'll to, to enjoy those things. One of these and days. I'll hang out for a few more minutes and then I've got to jump off for another, another commitment. But um, it's been great talking to you all. Thank you so much. Hey, Doug, this is Ken. Should we go ahead and get the uh, screen sharing set up? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, you should have ability, but. Um... Yep. Great. All right, can you see it? I can, yep. All right. Advance through slides or something. Looks good. Looks good. Yep. All right. So Bill, Bill will uh, Bill introduce you here in a few minutes. All right. Appreciate you speaking for us.
So I think we're at 125. Um, I'm ready to start, Bill. You... Yep, I'm here. I just walked back in with my espresso, so I'm ready to go. Oh, yeah, right. It was break time. So. Or at least the next 15 <laughs> minutes, and then I may have to refuel. There you go. So yeah, it was an, an excellent talk. Uh, we'll move on, and we have next Dr. Ken Casey. He's uh, employed by NOAA and the National Centers for Environmental Information, but he is actually here in his capacity as president of ESIP, which is the Earth Science Information Partners. And he's going to talk about the organization, about ESIP, its organizational structure, uh, how people can connect with and work with the organization and the efforts they're taking to support uh, data sharing and collaboration uh, within the earth sciences. So I'll turn it over to him. All right, thank you very much, Bill. And I, I just wanted to start by saying thanks for the opportunity to come and, and talk with you all about ESIP, the Federation of Earth Science Information Partners. Uh, I'm really excited to be uh, talking here in my role as the ESIP president. And my goal will be to do a really fast paced overview of who we are, uh, what we have to offer, how you can connect with us and how you can participate with us. Uh, ESIP is really a large community of experts, and we span a broad range of technical and, um, and domain-specific expertise, but we're all really focused on this idea of making environmental data matter. Um, I'll talk about the organization, the different ways you can connect and participate with us, and I'll really focus on our three-pronged approach uh, to supporting the community through, number one, virtual collaborations, uh, number two, in-person and hybrid meetings, and then number three, what we call our ESIP lab. Um, I'll try to sh share along the way a few success stories and, and kind of wrap it all up with a, a, a quick highlight of our 2021 through 2026 strategic themes and some of the things that we're doing to advance them. I, I really hope by the end of this, uh, this quick presentation, you'll see that ESIP is this open, collaborative, inclusive community, and really it's driven by its members and achieving much more together than we could apart. So our vision in ESIP is as a community to be a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, use, and reuse of our science data, information, and knowledge. And it's really important that we do this in a way that's responsive to the societal needs. You know, as we look around, the challenges we're facing in the world today here in 2021 are, are so great, but we also know that data is really at the heart of understanding and, and solving a lot of those problems. So as a community, we really want to ensure that the data are being used most effectively, most efficiently, and very importantly, in a fair and equitable way that is available to, to all who need it. We, we really built on this idea that um, and the belief that working together in a collaborative, coordinated fashion, putting data really at the heart of it all, we can solve some of the world's greatest problems. So, so who is ESIP? Well, we, we like to sort of talk about ESIP as a brain trust of earth science data professionals. Uh, we include individuals and organizations who are really working across the entire data life cycle from, from users to application developers, the, the tool developers, and of course the data providers themselves and the archivists. Uh, we are interdisciplinary and cross-sectoral. Um, we, we cross multiple scientific domains and one of the things that, that personally excites me the most about ESIP is it's really a community that bridges academia, private sector, and state and federal agencies as well. And so we provide this place that all of these groups can come together. We're lucky to have long, long standing federal support um, from NASA, NOAA, and USGS. And we are very proud of that, the fact that we're in this place where federal and state agencies like yours can come together to collaborate. So to, to really understand ESIP, it's important to understand sort of both of who we are and who we are not. Um, there is a common misconception out there that ESIP is actually the provider of data. Um, ESIP instead though really focuses on the people and connecting people. We operate at the top of this slide. Um, we provide the collaborative infrastructure that connects people together and helps them work together better. Um, those groups of collaborations might come up with recommendations and work projects and products and the people can bring them back to their home institutions to implement them. But ESIP does not provide the data or sustain that data infrastructure. We don't compete with our partners. We really focus on the human connections. 
um, so that they can work better together. Now really core to what we do in providing this collaborative, is providing this collaborative infrastructure. It's that backbone um, really focused on lowering the barriers to collaboration. So we're, we're very actively working to, to get rid of those barriers that are caused by geography, finances, temporal hurdles, and form a sort of support structure or the jungle gym is pictured in this uh, on this slide. What the community chooses to do on top of that jungle gym is really up to the community. And, and we're very aware that this collaborative infrastructure is not a static thing. It evolves all the time, especially in our COVID world today. And so our team is really always working to stay on top of the latest trends and innovations in the collaborative tools. And you can see on the right-hand side of this slide, just a, a, some of the examples of the variety of ways with that we help connect the community together. Now, of course, at the heart of all this, it takes real work by real people. Um, we, we don't take collaboration for granted, um, and instead we really mindfully enable it. Uh, pictured here are the, the core ESIP staff. Um, Susan Shingledecker is our new executive director and uh, comes to us from Severna Park, Maryland. Uh, below that is Annie Burgess, our ESIP lab director, and she's out in Bozeman, uh, Bozeman Montana. Megan Carter is our community director, and she works from Nyack, New York. And our newest team member, uh, Patty Allen, our ops director, is just down the road from me in Annapolis, Maryland. And I did want to call out, I think we've got Denise Hills, who's our vice president for ESIP. I think she's uh, on the line today and, uh, and very active in your community. So hi, Denise, if you're out there. Um, the, so very importantly, all of these folks are really bringing together a unique set of skills to the organization, and they focus doing all of that behind the scenes kind of work, and this team is really going above and beyond every day. So it's my hope that as you um, seek to engage more with ESIP, you'll get to know our team really well, and don't hesitate ever uh, to reach out to any of us um, at any time with questions. It's just a fantastic group of people. So I wanna shift and focus a little bit on these three key approaches that we take to enabling uh, the community, supporting the community, fostering innovation. So virtual collaboration, our meetings, and our ESIP lab. And I'll start with those virtual collaboration areas. Within ESIP, we support about 30 of them right now, and they're simply groups of people who convene virtually and regularly around a particular challenge or opportunity. You can see the list on the slide here, the current uh, currently active groups. Um, and they span from the more technical areas like cloud computing and machine learning um, to more uh, application-oriented areas like agriculture and climate or disasters. Uh, the standing committees, as their name implies, they persist over time, but the clusters come and go as needed. So when there's a need, a new cluster can spin up, do some work, and then spin back down. They can always, of course, reemerge if, if needed. So what do these uh, collaboration areas do? Well, the, the goals and format of each collaboration area are really dictated by the members of that, of that group, and they can vary quite a lot. Uh, some of them host webinar series like our IT and I Tech Dive. Uh, some have done things like develop guidelines for data citation. Others might lead open discussion. And almost all of them plan and convene sessions at our twice annual meetings. The, the groups are open. They're free to participate. You don't need to RSVP. Uh, but we do hope that if you join, that you really speak up and share what your needs and challenges are. Uh, we're all about trying to make these groups useful and relevant to, it, to their participants. And we want you to keep coming back, of course. So uh, as I mentioned, nearly all of these collaboration areas host breakout sessions at our, at our uh, twice annual meetings. Uh, this slide and the next one just show a few examples from our January meeting. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into any great detail, but just to give you a taste of the variety, for example, our new physical samples curation cluster hosted their kickoff event. We have a biological data standards group that's also relatively new, and they're looking at the informatics challenges associated with bi biological data. And our machine learning cluster, uh, they brought together multiple AI practitioners who share their experiences and workflows. Um, and so, you know, that's just a quick example. A few more. Uh, we have a community data cluster is looking at data gaps um, related to water quality and environmental justice in Flint, Michigan. 
Um, our research object citation cluster is uh, doing work to really bring credit to some important but often unrecognized roles um, related to research uh, objects. Uh, and our community resilience cluster um, hosted a working session that was really focused on gathering feedback on the cluster's uh, problem statement and the, and the work that they're going to be doing. One way that we um, bring all this together is in an annual webinar in the spring, um, our highlights webinar, and that, it's a great way to, to join in and uh, very quickly learn about a whole lot, you know, all of the, it's sort of like a rapid fire uh, kind of approach to see what all of the different collaboration areas are doing. Now, this, the second of the three approaches that I wanted to, to mention here was our ESIP lab. And the ESIP lab is a really interesting um, small grants approach to encourage skill development and community building, all with this idea of reducing the time to science. Um, we have two annual requests for proposals each year, um, and we we really encourage these projects and the applicants to focus not just on some sort of technology objective, but also a learning objective. The, the projects tend to be about $7,000 over six months. Um, and it, it, this is, it's a really unique approach because when we look at the impact of these things, we're, we're not just focused on what are you going to deliver? What's that technical objective? But we also want to see, like, have you developed a set of skills? Have you engaged the community? Have you built collaborations that are going to make the people involved more efficient, knowledgeable contributors to the community moving forward? So unlike a lot of sort of grant-based uh, activities, it's not just about some kind of technical deliverable, but also really about delivering a more capable community. Uh, an example of this, I won't go into great details, but we just kicked off this uh, ESIP lab project in my agency at NOAA uh, called the Cloud Pathfinders Program. We're going to bring together a cohort of projects to really not look at the cloud as something you have to ad adapt to, but as really something is that you can really jump into and leverage. And so we're working with ESIP right now to select those projects. And the third area I want to talk about is our quote unquote traditional meetings, which we don't see as being traditional at all. Um, you know, where in the sense where you go to a meeting, and you sit there and you listen to people just sort of present at you um, in a very passive way. Uh, ESIT meetings instead are much more active and dynamic. And what really makes them different is the amount of content that's contributed by the community tons of networking opportunities, and our very explicit focus on an inclusive collegial learning environment. The meetings are open to everyone. They typically draw a little over 300 attendees from across public, private, and academic sectors. Um, and you know, when we, when we talk to people about their experience at our meetings, the most frequent responses relate to you know, I met, I met a, a wonderful group of people. I kicked off a bunch of great collaborations, um, all the while coming away with some new technical insights. And, and so those are the things we really love to hear, uh, you know, from our, from our participants. A, a great example of one of the really fun and interesting things we do at our July meetings um, is something called Funding Friday. Um, it's a highly creative, fun approach. Uh, groups sort of dynamically come together uh, typically um, sort of on the Thursday or the Wednesday night of the meeting. Um, they work together, uh, create an idea, they put together a poster right there on the spot, and then they present it to the rest of the meeting attendees on the last day of the meeting. And everybody votes and, and selects a handful of these um, for student and member posters can win $305,000 and, and respectively to carry out that project that they just that they just came up with that they just uh, uh, figured out how to present, and then uh, the team goes off and does that work and, and reports on their progress at the next meeting. Uh, if, if you've ever had a chance to see one of these, and I and I hope you do, it's it's a it's an, even if you're not going to put one together, it's a super fun experience to be part of. There's a ton of energy in the room, uh, people running around exchanging ideas and figuring out how to visualize and present them. Um, another thing that we do, of course, at our meetings is what we call the research showcase. And when they were in person, this was usually in the form of, a, of an evening um, sort of poster reception. Uh, but it's translated really well into the virtual formats uh, during COVID, um, where um, 
you know, we people could come together again and exchange ideas, present what they're working on. In the virtual realm, it translated really well, where we had Zoom breakout rooms for uh, each of the presenter poster presenters, and you could move to any of those, just like you would as you're wandering around a, a poster session and find out what's going on. Talk you know, in a small one-on-one -on -one or in a small group with the people. So it's a great chance to meet others, learn about their uh, research and seed ideas for future collaborations. And again, it's really, you know, don't take my word for it. Talk to folks who attend these meetings. These are just some quotes um, from folks, uh, things like I found my earth science data people, or this is a clear home for, a home for earth science data people, or the hardest questions I ever got were at ESIP. These are the kinds of things that tell us we're, we're really on, on to something in the way ESIP is structured. Um, and we really want others to think about ESIP in this way too. So for the new folks to find their professional home uh, with us in, the, in that community. Another thing that we do outside of our own ESIP meetings uh, twice a year is we host what's called the Data Help Desk. And we do this at other conference venues, uh, things like AGU and AMS, uh, where we, we bring our, our community volunteers and, and uh, usually in the form of like a booth at a conference, uh, people bring their data and informatics questions. Uh, you know, what do I need to do to make my data more fair? Uh, and it's a great way for us to connect with the broader research community and really help showcase the tools and capabilities of our, of our members. Um, we, we've also done this virtually, you know, during the time of code, we've done three virtual uh, data help desks, largely on Twitter. Um, I've done them myself personally. It's an incredibly fun and rewarding way to share your experiences with a broader set of folks. So um, if, you, if you're wandering around, if we ever get back to an AGU meeting, um, you're wandering around and you see the ESIP data help desk, definitely stop by. So let me move toward closing by uh, just focusing on our, um, our ESIP shared agenda, really dr driving all of this work that we do to support virtual collaborations, to support the, the, the meetings and the ESIP lab is our shared agenda and our new strategic themes. We've just adopted a new set of five shown here on the screen. And I really wanna highlight the, the first one at the top of that list. It's, a, it's, it's really all about our commitment to promoting a healthy and inclusive culture within ESIP. Um, and that's more than just words. We're actually doing a lot in this front. We've established community participation guidelines with standards of behavior and procedures for reporting violations. We're engaged in things like bystander training and other forms of diversity and inclusion training. And we've really put them at the top of our list of strategic themes. Um, if you ask around an ESIP meeting, you will find quickly people um, do believe that ESIP is a welcome and inclusive space. It's got a great vibe to it, but we're, we're, we're a data-driven organization. And so one of my shared priorities um, as the president this year, along with Susan Shingledecker, our, our, our executive director, is to establish the metrics and monitoring to ensure that ESIP is in fact safe and inclusive for all and that it only gets better in time. So I hope that you can see um, there are many ways for you to get involved with ESIP. We want, we want ESIP to be the place where you can come to discover, to innovate, collaborate, and network. Um, you can join one of our collaboration areas. You can apply for these small grant funding opportunities uh, through the ESIP lab, and you can encourage your organizations to become ESIP member partners. Uh, you know, we really encourage you to engage in any and all the ways that are productive for you. And if you ever have questions about where you might plug in, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Denise or any of the folks uh, on the ESIP staff. Um, the, these folks, th this is what they, they thrive on is engaging. And so they're all, we're all there to help you engage. Um, so with that, if, if you just take away one thing, one action from today, I would recommend you sign up for that Monday uh, update mailing list down there on the bottom left of the screen. You can get a once a week uh, digest of all the things that are going around ESIP. And uh, just let me close by thanks, thanks again for the opportunity to come and speak with you. I hope you learned a lot today and I'm really happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. We have a, a couple minutes we can fit in some questions. We have a little bit of uh, flexibility built into the schedule. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you.
it looks like nobody's typed in any questions. Uh, I want to add though, I think it's, it was interesting. I uh, honestly didn't know that much about ESIP. I've heard the name. So it was, it was a great introduction for me and we'll definitely be looking at ways that we can interact more actively and, and regularly with the group. And I, I it was a great overview. So thank you. Thanks, Bill. Dr. Casey, I've got a question. Um, if somebody wanted to be involved with ESIP, how would they go about it? Should they email the staff? Um, is there a contact person for each collaboration area? Uh, yeah, and I would start with that email that's showing on screen right now, staff at esipfed.org. And like I said, you can sign up for that Monday mailing um, uh, summary list. But staff at esipfed.org, they can you know, they can direct you, right? So if you share a few thoughts about what you're interested in, what are your challenges, what opportunities are you looking for, they'll be able to just point you specifically right to the right collaboration area. They could hook you up with the, the lead of that of that particular topic and you could dive right in. It, you know, it's a sort of thing that only takes you minutes to get engaged with. It's, it's all designed to be as simple as possible. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, I'll turn my camera back on for just a, a few minutes. Uh, we have a poster session scheduled, but before that, we have uh, KGS staff awards. So uh, a couple of years, I think two years ago, we decided to institute KGS director's awards in order to recognize people who have made outstanding contributions to KGS over the, the previous year. Uh, the first year we gave them to a, a group of people who were really instrumental in the reinvigoration of uh, Earl, uh, which took about a year and a half or so. Uh, a lot of intensive effort that ranged from strategizing to working with university health and safety to physically moving a lot of stuff. And we've decided to continue that practice. And each spring since then, I've been asking my uh, KGS section heads and supervisors and managers to nominate people for the KGS Director's Awards. So I'm pleased to say that this year we have two awards to, to give out uh, to two different people at, at KGS for the contributions. Uh, and, and I think they're especially appropriate given the difficulties and the complications of, of the past year we've gone through. Uh, the first one is to Doug Curl, who is the head of our Geologic Information Management section. Uh, there's no way we could have gotten through this past year without a really robust um, information infrastructure and services of the people that work for Doug. He's also been very active in keeping our website and especially the, the geologic map service up to date uh, and was really instrumental in helping us to roll out the Cap Nelson story map uh, under a tight deadline last fall. That, that's been really well received. So I, re I, can, I can see myself, I don't see myself on the screen. Can people see me on the screen? I'm going to hold up the. We oh. can. We can. Yeah, I, I shared this. And thank you. Yes, for... we can. Okay, I was going to. Well, I guess I can't tilt it down. So here is uh, Doug's award. And it's sort of a. I, oh. It's hard to see. It's a oh. nice engraved glass thing. Uh, people may say that you can't, you know, put a, a price on this kind of dedication and service to the Commonwealth. Uh, but actually, we're the University of Kentucky and we can do outstanding things. And the university uh, has put a price on that. And I think it's like $50, which is the maximum amount we're allowed to spend on an award. Uh, <laughs> so we bought the best award we could find you for the amount of money we could spend. Uh, the second one is to Katie Ellis, who is our administrative coordinator and basically keeps the business of KGS running in, in terms of budget and human resources, uh, overseeing the, the details of the motor pool and, and just about everything non-scientific that we do. And again, it's been a very challenging year and she's really come through uh, under a lot of pressure, uh, always on time, always providing and often anticipating the kind of information we need to make decisions. So this will be Katie's award. Uh, it was a little bit awkward because I was trying to figure out like, how do we do this? Because normally Katie would actually order the awards. And I had the best of intentions. I was gonna find some way to secretly find the supplier she had used in previous years and order these and put them on my personal credit card so she wouldn't know about it. But I was so slow and inept at doing that, I finally had to 
call her one day or email her and say, we need to order these awards. And by the way, one of them is for you. Uh, so I, I really appreciate everything that both Katie and Doug have done for KGS over the, the past year. And we'll get these packaged up and get them to you so you can enjoy them uh, uh, as soon as you can. So thank you again for, for all of your efforts. Nothing thank you. Thank you, You're Bill. Oh, very surprised and honored. <laughs> but see, it worked at least for Doug. Doug was surprised. Well, I think Katie was too, but I was trying to make a bigger surprise. I was very surprised. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we have a uh, schedule next where we have a, we're a couple minutes ahead, it looks like, but we have a post session breakout scheduled. Uh, one of the things people mentioned as feedback last year is they missed the personal interaction from meeting in the lobby before the seminar to coffee breaks and, and chatting at the poster sessions. So we, we did try to recreate that as best as we could. We couldn't uh, send everyone a North Lime donut uh, while you were standing in the lobby, but we did set up a virtual lobby for people to, to gather in and really see each other, if not chat a little bit. Uh, we're trying to do the same with the poster session. So we've scheduled 35 minutes for a poster session breakout. Uh, there are several poster rooms and I think Doug is gonna put up uh, an option for people to go from room to room and look at the different posters. Uh, I think, Doug, you can fill me in. Can, can people stay here in this main room if they just want to hang out and, and talk or socialize as, as well? Yeah. As we go? Okay. So, so I'll open the, uh, the posters here in a minute. Um, there'll be six, six rooms. Um, and you can travel between the rooms um, or you can stay in this main main area. So I'm not going to, if you've done Zoom sessions before, you know, you sometimes get assigned. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. You, you just choose which um, room you go to. If the poster presenters can, they definitely need to go to their room and they'll share their screen and um, talk about their poster. You can ask them questions and um, just hoping for a nice interactive time. And um, I'll kind of drift between them and message or whatever, reminding people to switch rooms if, if they want, or they can just hang out, or they can yeah. hang out here and talk, or you can go get a cup of coffee. Yeah, and that, that's scheduled for 155 to 230. Uh, and then after that, we actually have an official break scheduled, again, because we, we don't want you to sit in front of your monitor for four straight hours without getting up. So we, we do what we wanted to put up a, a time so we could say back away from your computer, get a glass of water, take a quick walk down the street or something and get some fresh air. And then we'll reconvene for the, the rest of the technical sessions at 2.40 PM. So enjoy the posters and I'll be wandering in and out of some of the rooms so I may see you there. Uh, also, if anybody has any particular questions they wanna ask me about KGS, feel free to uh, either pipe up in the room or put something in the, the chat and I'll try to watch that as, as we go through the sessions. So you should see the poster <clears throat> breakout rooms open and you just go to the poster room that you want. Um, I can share the, uh, I'll share the schedule, but it's also, these are the posters um, and they correlate with the room. So I'm hoping this works. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. I guess there's a time limit on breakout rooms. So um. there is, but I've got the option to join a 
different one. Oh, okay. Well, everybody go join a new breakout room. Well, Same actually, it's the one I was in. Sorry, Doug. Oh. Um, so that doesn't. Yeah. But I can still join the, I can just scroll down and join different ones. Yeah, there's, there's so other ones you work. can join. Yeah. Um, they're still, still open. So um, that was a, I looked at all these settings and I didn't realize there was a time limit. So. Um, start sharing and then okay you know, about two more minutes or something but and then brian and i talked about it and i'm just going to keep sharing my screen and he's going to just have me walk through the slides that way we're not split you know sharing screens again it just takes more time you know i got you yeah all right so i'm going to go for that now share screen two click share and i'm going to switch over to that and hopefully now you can see title Looks slide great okay yep. awesome yeah thank you <coughs> okay well it looks like we're just coming up on 240. So I'll give a quick introduction and welcome everybody back from their break. Uh, we had a few glitches with the posters, so we apologize for that. I think every time we, we do this, we learn something new, but I uh, hope everybody got the opportunity to visit at least a, a poster or two and learn a little bit. We'll resume the presentations. The next one is by Jeff Jarakowski. Uh, from the National Geodetic Survey. He's actually the Appalachian Regional Geodetic Advisor, uh, which is in a way a lot like state geologists and people look at you and say, I didn't realize we had one. Uh, we also have a Regional Geodetic Advisor, in case you didn't realize we had one of those. They're very useful people. And Brian Bunch, who's the Kentucky State Geodetic Coordinator. Uh, Jeff is a surveyor, Brian is a surveyor, but it's especially interesting because Brian is also a geologist. And some of the work he's gonna talk about today uh, in describing how Kentucky is going to adopt to the new uh, spatial reference of 2022, actually incorporated KGS data and geology uh, in order to, to create some very high accuracy uh, survey zones within Kentucky. Uh, and, and it's also interesting too, because part of this process is, is that the old data, MAN 83, was actually written into Kentucky state law. So part of the process of moving forward actually involved me and others having to testify to the state legislature, explaining to them why we really needed to do this. And even yes, we had to give up the beloved US survey foot in favor of the international survey foot. So I'll turn it over to Jeff and Brian. All right, thanks, Bill. So I'm gonna start us off and then I'm gonna hand over to Brian in the middle here. All right, so who, I say NGS there, but let me say that, right? So we're the national, geodetic survey, uh, geodesy being the study of the, the size and shape of the earth. You say, well, don't we know that already? You know, for the most part, we know the shape, the size in general, uh, but one of the things that's a, a geodetic application or is really some heavy geodesy is gravity. So I want you to think about that as we move forward. You know, what do we know about gravity? We know a lot about gravity, but there, there's more, there's plenty more research to do on gravity. And so at, at the National Geodetic Survey, there's our mission. Uh, you're looking at our, our one sentence mission. And the, the important part is really the National Weapons System, or what's in red, you know, the NSRS. And you might think, uh, well, I don't even know what that is, right? So I'm going to look at really the, the bottom line items. Of it. There's a lot of other ancillary items that we could say of you know the nsr state but i want to just mention these right so you've got your latitude longitude, and height and this really goes back to uh what sarah talked about earlier we we've got to remember and i think a lot of us know this but it's the the layman lay people don't might not realize that these are maybe reference to some datum or reference system, right uh, so latitude, longitude, and height are, are themselves, 
you know, only part of the equation needed to put that position on the earth, right? The other items are your scale. And what do we mean by scale? Well, scale goes back to kind of what Bill just said, the units of measure, right? Uh, and so we do work all in our work is, is metric, uh, but we know that the user community, the, the people that use our, our datums, our reference frames, our reference system, don't always do that. So we do publish information uh, in the, the US survey foot and the international foot. And I'll briefly explain how that's gonna be changing in the future with these uh, new datums that we'll be publishing, right? So there's scale, right? Orientation, is that's your north, right? Magnetic north, grid north, geodetic north, right? There's more than one north. We know that too, just like there's more than one latitude, longitude, and height for a given position. That's a, a major mission of ours at NGS and part of uh, the overall mission is uh, that orientation. And there's there's the right there, gravity that I mentioned earlier, right? That's a huge important thing. gravity is when it comes to heights, that's when we're talking about an orthometric height or elevation, as, as most of us will say, right? Uh, gravity plays a, a huge important fact in, in publishing those orthometric heights. Uh, and why is gravity part of that? Why, how does it enter the equation? Well, what are we often trying to do when we look at orthometric heights or elevations, we're trying to look at where does water flow? Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? I mean, you know, water is gonna flow uh, the shortest course, you know, down uh, where gravity's pulling it, right? So we're talking about a consistent coordinate system that finds the items, but not just defines them, all how they change over time. That's an important factor as we move into uh, the future here, okay? So there's that keyword again, national spatial reference, common and consistent framework for all the geospatial professionals or anybody doing geospatial work, because without this framework, right, efficient GIS analysis just would not be possible. If we ever, I mean, we already see situations like Sarah described earlier, where we're we're just fortunate that the software can help us easily manipulate those different data when we run into that situation, right? But imagine if none of us had the same datum to work on. It, what, what, what all of us do would just not be possible, you know? So I want to talk real quickly about what is part of the NSRS. And so these items that I've highlighted here are probably the, the items that you're most familiar with, I would imagine, right? And the 83 and 27 are what we call horizontal datums, and as we're moving in the future, NA, the, the, the successor of NAD83 will, will be calling a reference frame, right? Our vertical datums, NABD88, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with that and working with uh, LIDAR data that uh, Bill talked about earlier. And then these geoid models. If you don't know what a geoid model is, or maybe it's kind of cloudy in your head, you think of uh, a geoid model as the bridge uh, that gets you from an ellipsoid height, right, which is just part of a, a grid, right, to that actual orthometric height, right, where that's the gravity-based elevation that you want. That, that's what a geoid model does for you, okay? And these tools are here, specifically this tool NCAT, if you look up NGS NCAT, you'll find it, uh, are transformation and conversion tools that are published by us at NGS, Thus, they're part of the NSRS, okay? Uh, there's some other, when I point out what is part of the NSRS, right? I, I've got to stop for a second and point out what is not part of the NSRS. I, I feel the need to anyways. And I really want to point out that WGS84. Uh, I see a lot of usage of it. I see a lot of people, I see a lot of misusage, or maybe not misusage, but confusion about it, okay? And I need to point out that it is not our product. I get a fair number of questions about WGS84, but that is a Department of Defense or DOD product. It's published by another agency, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, right? They're NGA, you know, we're NGS, right? So I uh, encourage you that if you really believe you're working in WGS84 to take a closer look at that, okay? Because uh, the change over time that I'm talking about and, and the dynamicness of a reference frame occurs also in WGS84. There's not just one rendition of it. 
There's uh, multiple renditions or realizations of WGS84, uh, just like there are NAD83. But NAD83, that's our product, right? Okay. Uh, these 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 geoid models over here, EGMs. What these are are uh, these correspond to WGS84. So these get you to orthometric height that are global geoid models. Okay, so that's what what those relate to. All right. But they're again not our products. So the two major positional components of this, this modernized NSRS, and that's what I'm going to kind of uh, finish up talking about, is the modernization of this National Spatial Reference System. Right? The two major positional components are your geometric, which is NAD83, and then your geopotential. You might hear orthometric height, like I a lot of stage elevation. Okay, and That's your NABD88. And what I want to point out quickly is that uh, we talk about um, latitudes and longitudes, and as everybody's familiar that those are part of our geometric or horizontal position, but the ellipsoid heights that we deal with, right, those two are part of the, the geometric component, okay? All right. And so as a part of this modernization of our nation's geodetic infrastructure, the NSRS, right, NAD83 will be replaced by what? It'll be replaced by the North American Terrestrial Reference Frame of 2022. We call it NATREF. That's how we pronounce it. NATREF. We made the acronym. We can tell you how to say it, right? So NATREF 2022. And uh, I want to point out real quick. So what this slide is showing you is how uh, the shifts occur as we change, uh, walk through the different datums of uh, historic or legacy datums in the U.S., and then as we walk through the different realizations, which is what this parenthetical is, of NAD83, right? You can see once we hit NAD83, we had these small shifts, but now with NATREF 2022, we're going to have this big shift. And why is that? Uh, well, the, the big shift is caused by uh, a, a change in the zero point of the reference frame. We've, we've refined the uh, center mass of the Earth through all of the various uh, GNSS and other satellite technology of the past 30 years. So what's, the, what's that going to look like? What's the magnitude of the change? So you see here, uh, there's a, just a contour showing uh, the change contour. So uh, cutting across Kentucky, there's a 1.1 meter contour. Uh, up here is 1.2. So you're talking about three and a half to almost four feet of horizontal shift in latitude and longitude across Kentucky. I like to think of it as my bumper stickers that I'll be selling here. Shift happens, right? But along with that shift, right, that's, that's our uh, one-time shift. There's also a drift, okay? And the drift is that time-dependent component, okay? The ship takes you to a certain epoch or a certain point in time. From there on, your coordinates in that ref will be time dependent. Whoop, time dependent, okay? We will provide you the tools though via different web services and APIs to account for that time dependency, okay? That's on us. And uh, we've got information about that on our website. And don't forget, along with the horizontal or the geometric component, NGB29, or we'll, we'll skip forward a bit, right? NABD88 will be replaced by what? The North America Pacific Geopotential Data of 2022 or NAPGD 2022. Let's take a look at, uh, let's zoom in a little bit here, the vertical change of, we're talking about, yeah, about a foot to a foot and a half across Kentucky. That's a, in a, a downward shift, okay? So don't forget, you know, that that's going to be, uh, could cause problems in your vertical alignment. Uh, just like what Sarah talked about with horizontal early. And I know I'm moving pretty quick, but we got a lot of resources on our website for this. Now I want to jump into state plane because, right, we love those projected coordinate systems, right? Uh, this is my little bumper sticker I came up with again here. You know, we'll be making the Earth flat again, one zone at a time. So as long as, or as well as NAD83, right, all those positions have a corresponding or correlated SPCS83 position. Those will be replaced by what? SPCS 2022, that will be tied to NATREF 2022, okay? Important things to know about this new, whoop, this new state plane system is it will be again referenced to NATREF 2022 in Kentucky. 
Uh, it'll be based on the same reference ellipsoid as any as SPCS 83. We're just changing that zero point like I talked about earlier. And you'll have the same projection types, okay? What's changing? We're minimizing a linear distortion or grid versus ground difference at the topographic surface, okay? The Earth's surface, not down on that ellipsoid, okay? Uh, we've done a lot uh, for... Uh, other states, but I want to kind of switch over to Brian here and let him show you what his efforts have been for Kentucky. So I want to wrap up with really quickly, wrap up my portion describing that whole U.S. survey foot deprecation that Bill mentioned. You could call it a retirement. Why? I like to think of it as the old uh, Susan Powder infomercials, right, from the nine rows. Stop the insanity. Why do we need more than one foot, right? Let's cut out that U.S. survey foot, move forward with the international foot, which is what we're doing. Uh, to align to the international scientific community. Remember that this is in conjunction with the new datums. Nothing will change until NATREF and SPCS 2022 are out and published. And uh, really, that, that's how we're going to do it. We just, everyone's going to adopt the international foot. Okay, that's how we're uh, going with this. You can find more information about that on our website. And uh, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Brian and I'm going to uh, hand the slides for him. All right, thank you, Jeff. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you, Brian. Excellent, excellent. So we're gonna start with how most people, including myself, uh, pretty much interact with the state plane coordinate system. And that starts with uh, selecting a pull down list for your coordinate reference system on your, on your particular project. You select state plane, that opens up and you get this mess. Um, there is a, a story behind the mess. You see the, it, so NAD 27 was great. It was like the, uh, the Model T. You got any color you want as long as it was black, just one option. Um, but things have changed. Uh, NAD 83 has very uh, many flavors, uh, the, mainly due to the advent of uh, space-based uh, positioning, satellite technology. Uh, however, uh, there is another problem there. You've got the international foot, you've got the meters, and you have U.S. feet. Uh, thankfully, this will go away because in uh, NATREF 22, you will have either meters or just feet, which will be based on the definition of the international foot. It won't be called that in the future. It'll just be called the foot. Uh, for Kentucky, you select NAD 83, U.S. feet, and then you have three options for Kentucky. Uh, now, the reason we go with these zones is originally, uh, if you look at the map, you see how the uh, country is sliced and diced into various zones. These were designed so that you didn't have distortion between the ellipsoid and the projection plane uh, greater than one part in 10,000. That's 100 parts per million. And it was designed to limit for the design areas of those zones. As you can see, Tennessee, if you can see that close, uh, has one zone because you could get all of Tennessee and stay within one part in 10,000. Kentucky, not so much. So we were uh, split into two zones. Brings us to our next slide, Jeff. And here we have it, North Zone and South Zone. And actually, this worked great for many decades. And the reason it worked great is the uh, limitations of terrestrial surveying. Uh, they, you're limited to a small area, even for large projects such as um, highway construction, design and construction. Uh, large uh, on a human scale, but small enough that you could still manage it within two zones. What happened is that during the 80s and the 90s, technology uh, gave us GIS. It gave us the ability to store and manage data in geodatabases, and we, we could actually display high accuracy data at very small scales and very large scales. And what happened is we needed to work with statewide data. Um, that was a problem. So next slide. UTM. Nope, no, no banana here. Kentucky split into two zones, and there are other issues as far as using UTM as a, as a single projection for Kentucky. So what we did, next slide. In 2001, actually in 2000, we developed a single zone state plane coordinate system for Kentucky. 
Uh, and we actually solved three problems that, that we were conf excuse me, confronted with. Uh, the first problem actually was we needed a single zone to cover the, the whole state. The second problem was the original uh, limitations of the state plan coordinate system was this one part in 10,000 relative to the ellipsoid and projection plane. Well, the ellipsoid is just an abstract mathematical surface we use for the convenience of mathematically um, uh, processing the, the projection itself. What we needed was a projection that minimized distortions on the surface of the earth where we live and build highways. So one of the design uh, objectives of the single zone was to minimize distortions at the ground with the projection plane. And we actually were able to accomplish that even back in 2000. Um, and if those of you who are very attentive, you'll notice that the map is skewed slightly to the north. It favors the northern part uh, up in Cincinnati. This was by design. We, um, we wanted to favor the highly urbanized areas of northern Kentucky as opposed to the rural areas down in the southwest portion of the state. Um, but even at that, we were able to achieve uh, distortions of less than one in 5,000, which was the, um, uh, if you're a surveyor in Kentucky, you know that if you're doing a boundary survey, a rural boundary survey, the, your air of closure cannot be worse than one part in 5,000. Well, that's the same as you get with the mapping projection here. And so we were very satisfied with this. So that's the you, problem number two, pretty much solved. And we can go to the next slide now. And problem number three with the uh, original state plane coordinate system is you had essentially two versions of two datums. Uh, uh, zones and three of them overlapped in coordinate space. Now what that meant is if you were uh, presented with a set of coordinates by somebody and there was no metadata, <laughs> what's that metadata? Um, you couldn't tell what zone you were in. And this may seem like an esoteric problem, but it crops up and it cropped up quite a bit. Uh, the way we solved this is when we designed the uh, single zone, we put it in a, a unique coordinate space all of its own. And so any anytime I get a set of coordinates and it's within that range, I know that immediately that's a single zone uh, position, which is great. Uh, okay, we can go to the next slide now. All right, this, is, I love this figure, this map, and not probably not for the reasons you think. This is the an Armin Lobeck. Uh, it was probably circa 1930, and that's essentially when NAD 27 came out, but the reason I like this is because this map is the culmination of decades of geologic mapping and, and uh, exploration, and they did it back then the hard way, from the south end of a northbound mule. And um, it, if you're going to design, now the, the reason for this map today is for us to do, we're going to try to slice and dice the state into a series of low distortion mapping projections and achieve statewide coverage. And if you're going to do that, you need to really know the lay of the land. And this does it in a, in a general sense. Um, and uh, like I say, back in the day, they, even as, as um, early as, as 1930s, uh, the geologists had a really good sense of what was going on in Kentucky ge geologically and topographically. Uh, and all was left for us to do is fill in the details. Uh, next slide, please. And fill in the details we did. And thanks to um, William Andrews, uh, Drew, and Emily Morris, uh, we have this figure on the various uh, uh, regions of the state. And what this does is give me an idea or gave us an idea of how are we going to partition the state into zones that we can then do uh, ground to grid mapping projections. Uh, and you can actually see regional trends. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now this, this gives us our elevation trend or the, uh, the general regional sloping trend for the state. And for you, geolo you geologists, think of this as, a, as looking at uh, strike and dip. So the strike is generally from southwest to northeast and then we have a dip of uh, southeast to northwest. And this will play a prominent role in optimizing mapping projection performance, at least for one of our zones. Uh, next slide, please. Now, another criteria that we wanted to meet with respects to uh, parsing out the state into zones is that we, we have them defined by whole counties, as groups of whole counties. And we didn't want to create just another group of whole counties because we have various districts in Kentucky already. We have the highway districts, we have fish and wildlife districts, division of water districts, and we looked at all of those. I did at least. And what, we, what I found was the Kentucky's area development districts, not only is this an administrative partitioning of counties, this is a statutory partition of, of uh, counties. And not only that, but if you remember what the other uh, physio physiographic maps looked like, you'll notice, you, you'll recognize a pattern here. And that doesn't surprise me. These are development districts and there's a strong correlation between uh, physical geology, geography and economic. And this, this partitioning of development districts kind of bears that out. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we found is that this partitioning fit the uh, physiography so well that we were able to combine districts and create state plan coordinate zones based on the comb combination of these districts. Uh, we even were able to, to combine up to three. Uh, two of the zones are a combination of three districts. And all of this sprung forth from looking at the physiography and the physical geology of the state. Uh, that played a crucial role in it. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not a cartographer. I don't pretend to be one. I don't play one on TV. All I do is I create figures and try to use contrast to show uh, how things are performing. And what you see here is based on uh, ground to grid performance, uh, we were able to cover the whole state with seven total zones and uh, the, the statistics are that over two thirds of the state is, achieves a 20 parts per million or better. Uh, that's, that's one in uh, 40, 50,000, one part in 50,000. Um, and then we were able to get over two thirds of the state or no, uh, yeah, three quarters of the state within one part and uh, 30 parts per million. So we were very, very pleased with this performance outcome. Next slide, please. And I'm particularly proud of, of the, uh, the zone three, the southeast, because we pulled every tool out of the box to optimize this particular zone. As you can see, the general geographic trend is, is along the strike line of southwest to northeast, and that called for a, a um, oblique Mercator projection. But not only that, if you remember the dip, you went from southeast to dip down to, to uh, northwest. What we did is we, ske we skewed that projection axis up toward the northwest and what that did is that that tilted the projection plane ever so slightly and brought it in line with that regional strike trend or that dip trend. Um, and that get, garnered us much better performance if we had centered that projection axis on the general trend of that poly, of the, the overall polygons. So that's the power of the techniques that are actually outlined by Michael Dennis. And if, if any of you have read any of Michael Dennis's materials or seen his presentations, this utilizes all the little tricks that he recommends with respect to optimizing ground to grid performance. Uh, next slide. So here's the outcome. And uh, we're very proud of this. It, and one of our goals was to minimize the number of zones. Look, if you want to get high performance, 
you just slice it into a lot of little zones and, and you don't even have to think hard about it. But our goal was to try to get the minimum number of zones, uh, contain them within administrative groupings of counties and uh, achieve the best performance with respects to, to gaining low distortion. And low distortion we defined as at least 50% or more of 20 parts per million or better and two thirds or more of 30 parts per million. And we achieved that uh, hands down with room to spare. Um, and uh, we also, uh, with the help of Michael Dennis, uh, if you'll look at the Skittles map there, again, I'm not a cartographer, but um, uh, we do have a new and improved single zone and because we have the, um, the low distortion zones, we decided to just perfectly, as best we can, center the performance on our new single zone so that we're not favoring any particular region. It's, it's designed to achieve statewide balanced uh, uh, performance regardless of urban or rural. Uh, next slide. So, and in, in doing this, we also were able to uh, achieve unique coordinate space or um, uh, spatial domains for each of the zones. Each zone occupies its own unique position uh, in space, in general coordinate space. And uh, for the seven zone layer, we actually were able to differentiate them by more than uh, 20 to 50,000 meters, which makes it easy to, diff if you get a set of coordinates and you look at it, you can look at this, this diagram and determine what zone it's in, if it's a state plane zone. Uh, next slide. And uh, that's it. I, I haven't been paying attention to time. I apologize for that. I'm way over. I just now looked at what time it is, but this is my last slide. And if you want, there is a standards and specifications document and it goes into great detail about the state plan coordinate system in general and specifically in Kentucky and the design and how we designed the, uh, the NatRef 22 version. And there's a nice little poster you can download as well. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Brian and Jeff. This is actually going to be a, a extremely important topic and I think for the reasons that Sarah showed so well earlier. Uh, I remember many years ago I was teaching a class and tried to illustrate why it actually mattered, uh, what, why things like datum actually mattered. And I was lectured by the students who told me that this wasn't really important and they needed to know other things rather than this mundane datum projection kind of stuff because nobody in the real world cared, but, but actually they do. It has really important implications. So uh, thank you for that. Good overview. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions coming up in camp and other organizations and, and, and the GIAC meetings in, in Kentucky. Uh, but people like Brian and Jeff are here to help us make the transition. And uh, I'm sure they'll, uh, oh, we don't have time for questions right now. You might send some in the text directly to Brian or follow up with him or Jeff individually. Uh, by the way, because I went over, I will stick around. And if anybody has questions after the, uh, after the seminar, I'll stick around even longer to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. The next person up on the schedule is Matt Crawford from KGS. Uh, Matt is the, I, I guess, informal leader of a very active and productive landslide research group. Uh, working on a, a number of topics, including uh, a study that recently concluded, it was a multi-year FEMA study of landslide hazard and risk in the Big Sandy ADD. And we have additional work proposed, but there's been a, a lot of really interesting work that's come out of that. And Matt is going to talk about, Matt is going to talk about how we've been doing that uh, in Eastern Kentucky. So Matt, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, when I hit screen share, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know if I need, if that needs to be allowed for me or not. Try now. Sorry, Matt. Okay. Forgot about you. <laughs> okay.
Can everyone see the presentation mode and hear me? Yeah, it looks good. Yes. I can. You're good. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about landslide susceptibility and risk in Eastern Kentucky today. Um, let's first look at, at landslides across the, the state. This is a landslide inventory map of Kentucky, and you can uh, get a sense of the high hazard areas, right? There's lots of points and blobs uh, all over, but particularly in some counties in Northern Kentucky, there's lots of uh, landslides in Eastern Kentucky coal field, and you can see other interesting clusters. Um, the locations come from a variety of sources representing many landslide types. Um, you can also see some source biasing there with, with lots of locations along roadways, for example. Uh, there's a couple of ways to access this data if you want. Uh, you can uh, look at it through the KGS Geologic Map Information Service and users can zoom into these locations and query various attributes for each location. Uh, the data is also available for download uh, at the UK Knowledge uh, website, which uh, the URL is there. And so inside this yellow circle that just came up is where we're going to focus today. Uh, but speaking of landslide types, it's important to remember that landslides are a complex phenomenon. We're, we're, we're talking about the downslope movement of rock and soil or some combination of rock and soil. And and that happens because the stresses on the slope are greater than the slope material strength. And so these uh, are complicated mechanics and that means there's lots of types of landslides. Um, and the types are dependent on uh, material and material behavior like velocity, but you can see there's falls and topples and, and slides and flows. And it very much matters what kind of material is involved. Is it bedrock where you might have rock falls, uh, rock slides, is it uh, coarse grain slides or maybe a debris slide or a coarse grain flow that can be quite mobile and dangerous like a debris flow. So there's all kinds of things that can happen uh, with landslides and it's important to keep that in mind as we go forward here. So let's look at some of the motivating factors for doing this uh, project that I'm going to talk about in this research. Um, Conservatively, landslides cost the state anywhere from 10 to $20 million a year. Uh, this is direct cost only, so that says nothing about indirect costs like uh, road closures, uh, decreased property value, things like that. The photo on the left is a thin translational slide that came down on a road in Floyd County. Uh, the photo on the right is the headscarf of a a thicker rotational slump that is threatening this home in, in Floyd County. Some of you may remember this from February of last year. Uh, a debris flow came down on some railroad tracks in Pike County. Uh, a train coming along hit the landslide deposit, uh, derailed and then slid into the Russell Fork River below. Uh, the train cars were carrying ethanol which then caught on fire. And uh, several train engineers had to escape the fiery blaze of, of the derailment and the cold waters. And, and luckily did that with, with minimal injuries. Uh, but this was quite an event, as you can see. Uh, the photo on the right uh, seems to suggest a really mobile deposit that, that came down a steep slope and sort of was conf confined there to a narrow, narrow ravine, it looks like. Uh, this is a photograph from South Williamson, Kentucky in Pike County that I took just uh, in March, or uh, it happened in March. Uh, it's when much of Eastern Kentucky was hit very hard with flooding. And this is the kind of thing that can happen after floodwaters recede. Um, poor pressures remain high in, in stream bank deposits uh, after the water recedes, and that, that will uh, cause landslide type uh, bank collapses like you, you see here, which can be very problematic. Okay, let's talk about uh, how we're combating these problems. Um, we've been working on landslide susceptibility and risk 
uh, project for the past couple of years. It's uh, facilitated through a FEMA pre-disaster mitigation grant. Uh, the project area is five counties in Eastern Kentucky, uh, McGothan, Johnson, Martin, Floyd, and Pike County, which all make up the big Sandy Area Development District. Um, the purpose is to assess landslide hazards, reduce risk, and support county and ad district hazard mitigation plans and strategies. Um, as you can see, there's variable relief in the Big Sandy counties. It's a part of the Eastern Kentucky coal field uh, in the Appalachian Basin, uh, but there's steep slopes, narrow valleys. Uh, the, the bedrock geology consists of flat line sandstones, shales, siltstones, coals, underclays, uh, and there's a, a really variable colluvial soil thickness that blankets these, these slopes that can be problematic as well. So I mentioned landslide susceptibility. I, it's probably a good idea to define what that really means. Um, landslide susceptibility is a classification or rank of, of the relative tendency or potential for slope movement in an area. Um, often it's discussed separately from a, a hazard map. Um, which may indicate elements of time or landslide extent or behavior. And we're not getting into those things in this study necessarily. So our approach for landslide susceptibility was a geomorphic based statistical method. And I'll say that there's many ways to, to model landslide susceptibility. But uh, geomorphic based statistical approach uh, models slope conditions that influence landslides. So why did we choose a statistics-based method? Well, one, uh, a lot of you've heard about today, the quality and resolution of LIDAR-based terrain models really is the engine that drives this kind of work. The, the LIDAR in Kentucky is fantastic. The, the hillshade models, uh, DEMs, derivative LIDAR products that we can use for large countywide areas has, has been great for a geomorphic-based uh, model. Uh, in addition, there's, there's several machine learning and statistical techniques for modeling landslide susceptibility that are practical, uh, not terribly complicated, and, uh, and have been proven to have strong model performance. And as you'll see as we go through this, there's a combination of techniques uh, that you can do, uh, and we have found that will strengthen model accuracy and reliability of, of your model and any maps you make because of that. And also, since we're looking at landscape characteristics and features in hill slopes that indicate landslides, that's important. And that's important because existing landslide deposits are often susceptible to reactivation and, and they're often susceptible in dangerous ways. So, you know, an existing landslide on a slope can remobilize to something more dangerous, like a debris flow. So, we want to pick out those areas as best we can. Okay, uh, the first step in this project was uh, compile landslide inventory. Uh, this is a key piece of work, particularly for a geomorphic-based statistical approach. We identified 1,054 landslides in McGoffin County, sort of the starting point here. Uh, they're primarily thin translational landslides and, and thicker rotational slumps. They're, you can see the distribution of the slides there in the county. Um, they're small to moderate, some large size slides, uh, you know, mean landslide area of you know, close to 70,000 square feet. We did not determine age or potential behavior, but just, just mapped the extent of these, these deposits. And the quality of the hill shade and other LIDAR derivatives and aerial imagery was really instrumental in this part of the project. So we took those 1,054 landslides from Agoffin County, we buffered the mapped landslides, and we also buffered non-landslide areas with a polygon buffer based on the average size of the landslide in the county. So if you look at the zoomed in hillshade over here, the dashed line there is a mapped landslide deposit, the dot is a centroid of the landslide, and then we uh, created a, a circular buffer around that centroid so we could harvest uh, geomorphic statistical variables from those buffers. 
we extracted uh, values from geomorphic variable raster maps, which you see listed here. Um, and uh, also the, the, the six statistical categories to go along with each of these geomorphic variables. And you end up creating a, a binary data set uh, that we can assign an indicator variable to. So we assigned a one to all the features that were landslides and a zero to uh, the features that were not landslides. So back over to this hillshade map, here's a non-landslide area with a centroid and buffered that. Uh, so we end up with this 36 variable data set for all 1,054 landslides. It's a big honking data table. But I'm just showing you here an example subset of slope, just to kind of show you some numbers, uh, min, max, range, mean, standard deviation, sum of slope. Here are, uh, here are landslides, here are non-landslides. It's worth noting here that we, we did not include bedrock geology. We do know that lithology varies across the region and some particular rock types are more problematic than others with landslides, but um, we treated it as sort of the mapped geology as sort of a uniform uh, uh, thing of, of the input across the, the region and didn't include it. So using 36 variables to create a landslide susceptibility map is just not realistic. Uh, so we, went, we wanted to trim this down. So we applied a machine learning random forest classifier called bag trees to help elucidate uh, what variables were important. Uh, bag trees uh, ranks relative importance of hill slope variables regarding landslide occurrence. It's called bag trees because uh, it combines statistical results of many individual decision trees in order to improve model performance and reduce model overfitting. Um, so this was the first part of our combined machine learning approach to get at landslide susceptibility. Um, after running bag trees function, we took the top 12 ranked variables, uh, which you see listed down over here in the right, uh, which were all above uh, the average feature important importance ranking, which you see in the bar graph on the left here, feature importance, and then just these, this is just the feature number. But 0.8 was about the average. We took everything above that and included it as important. And you can see this bag trees performed very well as far as model performance with an area under the curve of 0.9. So uh, taking 12 variables from the bag trees, we were ready to do a logistic regression analysis. Um, this is sort of the second part of the dual machine learning approach. Uh, logistic regression models the probability of an event, like a landslide, uh, being a function of other variables. It, indicates which model relationships are statistically significant. So it's a little bit different than the bag trees. Um, but the, the equations here really are showing the model of the binary dependent variable, right, our one or zero, and it's a nonlinear transformation of calculating the log odds of the one for all of those uh, independent variables you saw. Um, and uh, the plot here just shows uh, a predicted probability uh, uh, on the y-axis and mean plan curvature on the x-axis. And this is just to show that mean plan curvature is statistically significant. There's something going on here um, with the uh, importance of mean plan curvature with uh, all of those uh, records in the, in the big data set. So uh, these are the logistic regression results and the most significant indicators that a landslide uh, exists or that the, the conditions on a slope may contribute to a landslide. So we it spit out eight variables, minimum slope, min curvature, standard deviation of elevation, and so on there in the list. And their uh, p-value, which is uh, just the measure of, of significance. Um, you can see the, the model performance here again was, was quite good at 0.83. And the bag trees technique ranks relative importance regarding influence on landslide occurrence. But 
the logistic regression indicates which model relationships are statistically significant via equations in those regressions equations. And so we think that the logistic regression is a really good complement to the initial bag tree classification and, and using these things together got us a really good landslide susceptibility map. We uh, took those eight variables and plugged them into the uh, regression equation and were able to make a landslide susceptibility map for all five counties in the Big Sandy ad. Uh, this is just showing you one zoomed in area of uh, Johnson County. Uh, so you can see in the table here, we've got our probability uh, uh, values and our landslide susceptibility classifications uh, based on those probability values. Uh, then you can go on and you know, look at some other important things here regarding landslide susceptibility, um, the percent area, the intersected buildings with the landslide susceptibility um, classes, percent roads, percent railroads. I'll just, just point it out here that 42% of Johnson County is classified as moderate or greater with as far as landslide susceptibility. Um, I would be curious to, uh, to know what Dr. Battersby thinks of our colors here on the landslide susceptibility map. We've got you know, low five classes, low to high. You can see ro roads here, the black little polygons are buildings. So we think this has ended up being a quite a good map that strikes a good balance between indicating existing deposits, but as well as assessing other parts of slopes that don't necessarily show obvious slope movement, like in a hillshade, for example, but most likely has features related to landslide activity. Let's uh, shift over to uh, risk here. Um, this figure does a good job of highlighting uncertainties associated with landslides, right? What, what do we really know about these, these features? Um, how far will they move? How big are they? How fast will they move? How often do they occur? And these are very challenging questions. Um, at the root level, we're, we're talking about the intersection of hazard and exposure. Uh, so what are your elements at risk? And then you can take that and, and come up with an equation that includes a few more things like the, the vulnerability of your elements at, at risk and what those consequences may be uh, with regards to a landslide happening. So you can come up with an equation like this um, where H is a hazard and in our case, it's gonna be our landslide susceptibility data. Uh, these vulnerabilities or your expected degree of loss to elements at risk, and this is looked at as a scale of zero to one, one being complete loss. Um, and then C is consequence, the, the product of your elements at risk and their economic value. So that's how we did it. And for us, that, that means uh, we looked at the population, roads, railroads, and land type, and we were able to come up with a very broad economic value for these, these things uh, with, from, from a variety of sources here, you can see in the table. Um, but, but again, um, here's our risk equation. So the H is our landslide susceptibility data. V is vulnerability. We just used a one for that. We're just gonna sort of broadly assume it's a, a loss. Um, and then our consequence variables are your elements at risk times the economic value. And I'll say for the elements at risk, we were able to uh, use a lot of kernel density maps that we found very useful. So we created kernel density maps of roads, railroads, buildings, and, and uh, this is just an example of a kernel density map uh, that uh, shows population density. So these were helpful in um, turning all this together. And what we came up with is what I call a static socioeconomic risk map for landslides. So what does the map look like? Looks like this. I'd also be interested to see what Dr. Battersby thinks about these colors. Um, but uh, we classified the resulting risk factors as low, moderate, and high. Uh, to create risk uh, data sets and maps for each county, uh, the classes are based on the standard deviation of the natural log. So we didn't just go with natural breaks. Uh, the, the results you know, are, are kind of funky. It's a non not normal distribution of data. The numbers are kind of weird when you 
and you multiply all those things together. So you can see the risk factor here in the table, percent area. Oh, this is, this is just an example. Uh, this is just Pike County and an area zoomed in in Pike County. Percent area and our landslide risk classification. Uh, we excluded the lowest risk factor because that was usually uh, ridge tops or usually ridge tops where there's, there's no assets there, there's, there's no risk there. Uh, so here's a zoomed in area of a risk map for Pike County. You can see low in the blue, moderate purple, and high in the orange. You can see some, uh, some roads here. The black are, are buildings. And so we think this map turned out quite well. So a big part of the FEMA pre-disaster mitigation project uh, is stakeholder input and hazard mitigation plan strategy. And those goals really revolve around reducing potential losses, reducing overall vulnerability to the built environment from landslides. And we spent a lot of time communicating with stakeholders. This was a meeting we had uh, prior to the pandemic, obviously. Were we able to ask stakeholders what's important to them and come up with some things that they can put in hazard mitigation plans that will be helpful. So things like improve spatial evaluation with all this data they have now, uh, map and data access. So they can do more with a critical facility assessment perhaps or establishing tolerable risk criteria or landslide response. Uh, you know, things like managing development uh, preventing impact to roads, which is a big, big problem, right? You, you might be able to, with this data now, you might be able to help with road design or stabilization or monitoring. and Even just general awareness with this data now um, will be improved, I think, for, for this part of the world. Um, that's it. I wish I had more time to show you some more of the, the, the map areas, but um, please get with me if you want to see that. We did this for all five counties. Um, in the ad district, we used a, a dual machine learning approach to uh, model and map landslide susceptibility. We completed a socioeconomic landslide risk assessment for all five counties, and I, would, you know, I really think there's room for improvement there, and we've already started working on that. Uh, we focused on communication, what is best for end user stakeholders, and I'll, I'll say that this is a great project. Uh, I really enjoyed being a part of a proactive effort to support infrastructure, land use planning, awareness, safety. Um, and a, it was a perfect opportunity for research, but also applied geology that's valuable to, to Kentuckians. And uh, I didn't do this all on my own, of course. I had a, a lot of help from a lot of smart people. I'd like to thank uh, KGS colleagues, Bill Hanneberg, Jason Dort, Hudson Cook, Ishwan Zhu, Ashton Killen. Junfeng, Zhu, Xinming, Wong, Megs Math, uh, Sebastian Bryson and Sybil, Nick Grinstead at the Martin School, a couple of professors and statistics that helped me, Dave Cordy at the North Carolina Survey, FEMA, Kentucky Emergency Management, and the Big Sandy Ad. If you're interested in some of the more nitty gritty details, this paper just came out uh, in uh, Quarterly Journal of Engineering, Geology, and Hydrology. So uh, if you want to check it out, let me know. And I'll give you a copy. But that's all I have. So thank you. Thanks, Matt. We're, uh, looks like we're about five minutes or so over. So we don't have any time for questions. But uh, again, if people have questions, you can bring them up in the chat. And Matt should be around to try to answer those. And also, uh, during the break, and uh, even I think during the, the map blast, there may be some opportunity to do uh, test map some follow-up questions uh, but we want to try to keep uh, fairly close to the what we still have left of our schedule the last of the oral presentations today is going to be by dr amy wolf at kgs who works in the areas of geohealth and environmental chemistry and the topic of her presentation is going to be linking environmental exposure and health outcomes the importance of data coordination and this is going to be like a really important topic because as we're finding geological information is more and more relevant in things like public health studies 
uh, we need to make sure that, that people are using the right data and understanding the, the geologic context of the studies, uh, because otherwise it's, it's easy to go badly wrong. So Amy, go ahead and start. Good afternoon. Can everyone, uh, miss, I'm hoping people see my slides and, and not my notes. Yeah, no, they look good. Okay, great. Um, so I, I realize that I'm the only thing standing between uh, everyone and a break followed by the map blast. So uh, I'll try and, and not go over. I want to talk a little bit about a project that was funded by uh, UK CARES here on campus, um, where we're going to be leaking environmental exposure with health outcomes. And the UK CARES is, stands for the Center for Appalachian Research in Environmental Sciences, if you are not already familiar with it. So within the last decade or so, the importance of integrating the environment, uh, people, and climate has slowly transitioned from being an academic concern, I guess, into a broadly societal concern that is becoming a part, I guess, of society's collective consciousness. And so the quote at the top was taken from a book uh, published in 1989. I was actually collecting dust on the library shelf when I found it, and it's just states our quality of life is inextricably uh, linked to the environment. But if we were to drag this into the 21st century, uh, Joyce Masua, who serves as the deputy executive director of the UN Environmental Program, kind of forcefully modernized the sentiment. Um, and she stated that the science is clear and the health and prosperity of humanity is directly tied with the state of our environment. So uh, this is sobering, but the concern is understandable. If you look at the image on the left, these sort of environmental risk factors, so air, water, and soil pollution, chemical exposures, climate change, UV radiation, globally they contribute to more than a hundred different diseases and injuries. And so some of the statistics are shown on the right, um, and we can see that the majority of chronic disease outcomes are attributed to the environment. The majority, vast majority of environmentally related deaths are currently due to cardiovascular diseases like stroke and heart disease. Um, but in the future, the UN is uh, forecasting that pollutants in freshwater systems will be the major cause of death. And this is concerning when we think about the projected population of the world, which is expected to reach almost 11 billion by the year 2100. So not to depress everyone, but one of the big takeaways, probably the main takeaway from today is that these big complex problems require communication and cooperation across discipline uh, boundaries and certainly international organizations like United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, you know, they're in agreement that unless we put more emphasis on environmental protections, that sort of the consequence of inaction is going to continue to create public and environmental health issues. And I think sometimes it's easy to kind of, you know, dismiss those because of the scale of the organization, you know, it's very broad, but certainly these issues are also going to have impacts at regional and local uh, levels. And just in even at a local level, some of these uh, problems are, are going to be quite large and complex, and it's going to require a coordinated, interdisciplinary, collaborative response to really be able to increase public awareness and then develop that response. So one of the ways that this is being addressed here is through the creation of new scientific fields such as geohealth. Um, and really UK and KGS are at the forefront of this. We're one of the few institutions to even have an established program. Uh, sometimes when I tell people that I'm in geohealth, they, they look at me 
like I'm crazy because it's basically phrases that we don't normally associate. So while we want our rocks to be happy and healthy, that's not what geo health is conceptually. Uh, we want to understand relationships between places, people and animals and their health outcomes over time. And it, this really, this field uh, developed from actually distinct experiences of geoscientists who have collaborated broadly across disciplines to understand these interactions between environmental processes, exposure and, and human health. So it's, uh, it's very creative field. So what we what we want to do, we can think of of a sort of our traditional approach is that the health sciences uh, is you know it's over on one side, and we have earth sciences on the other, and these are largely traditionally very disconnected um, disciplines, but. What we're trying to do with geo health is really build a bridge between these two disciplines. And so one of the ways is if that we're doing this is, you know, by integrating uh, health data with geospatial techniques, statistics and data analysis, or even bringing in some analytical methodology and approaches from geochemistry, when we start integrating, you know, the bread and butter from the geo field with data from the health sciences, it can help provide insight into the causation of diseases, the spatial pattern of disease. It can facilitate the development of improved exposure maps and even risk, uh, risk assessments. Um, and so at the end, by doing this, we have a healthier, uh, healthy communities. So for this, um, for the grant that uh, was funded by UK CARES, I kind of sp split this up into three. What do we know? What do we need? And um, where are we going? And the focus is on really Eastern Kentucky. The overarching goal of the project was to identify, compile, inventory, and catalog publicly available social, environmental, and health data sets for the Appalachian region of Kentucky into a single data warehouse. And this really also builds on the geospatial data sets and analytical capabilities that we have at KGS, which is really exciting. So, on the image on the right, that's showing um, the cancer incidence rate broken down by county for all of Kentucky. Um, on the right, the different colors correspond to a different rate. So if you aren't familiar with what an incident rate is, it's basically the number of new cancers of a specific site or type like lung cancer or um, breast cancer that occurs in the population. And it's usually expressed as the number of cases per 100,000 population. And so it's interesting, um, you know, Kentucky has the highest all site cancer incidents. It has the highest mortality rates um, within the US. You can see that um, you know, graphically in the image only three counties within the state of Kentucky, Hickman, Hancock, and Elliott have rates that are lower than the national average. All others exceed the national average. And so it's it's complex. We know that um, people in this area tend to, they um, use tobacco. There's also um, radon exposure. Um, but there are other possible contributing factors. Um, this area has a long history of industrial activity. So like coal mining, oil and gas development, power plants, refineries. So this poses multiple exposure sources and pathways. And there also might, uh, this area may have elevated sort of naturally occurring concentrations of these heavy metals and soils and rocks that people that are you know, being mobilized, 
transported and then transferred into, into different areas. Um, and so what do we know? So an important component was simply collating a diverse suite of data sets derived from multiple uh, sources in they were all different formats and a varying quality and usability. Um, I basically organized the data into these five different sections. So in the blue, it shows what that section was called. The italics um, show, provide a brief description. And then in that far right column, it shows some examples. And so each of, of these different data sets, so this is, um, a screenshot of one of um, within Excel for um, showing what some of these specific examples are. Um, so each data set was evaluated using a graded approach to assess, like how good is the data? Um, are there any inconsistencies? You know, can we even use it? And so when I started this project, no one really knew what data was out there. Um, and so that was actually relevant to individuals living within Appalachian, Kentucky. And so, um, you know, having these data sets in a single place and using a formal sort of systematic approach um, in assessing this was a first step to address this knowledge gap. And you know, at a minimum, highlight areas where information was critically um, needed. And so uh, there was a lot of data. Um, and it's right now it's 240 um, and climbing. So what do we know? Um, we have a start. The next is what do we need? Um, so certainly part of that is coverage. And so the image on the right shows um, locations where stream sediments were collected um, for and analyzed for lead. This was done by the USGS in the 1990s. And what you can see is that some um, parts of the state, there's a lot of data. And then in other areas, there is nothing. And this, uh, this is pretty consistent for a lot of the different geos, uh, geospatial data sets I was able to find. Some areas are great um, and some areas not so much. So definitely um, increasing our coverage. The other is updated values. So uh, this geochemical data set was from the USGS. You know, it was, it's great, um, but it's you know, almost 30 years old. So getting new values, certainly these have changed. Um, as through changes in land use um, and other human activities. And then the other is new approaches um, to collect info. And so one of the ways that we can do that is, um, you know, using different geochemical techniques, integrating sort of lab and field uh, scale investigations, developing sen uh, sensors, and even, including sort of harnessing the power of uh, citizen science. And so the next um, part is, oops, um, within the context of, you know, what do we need in these new approaches to look at data? One of this is, I'm gonna give you uh, an example of a way that that we've been able to sort of integrate health data sets with geospatial um, here at the end. So I, I do want to state that um, that this, the information that I'm showing, um, it's just to show patterns. It's not assessing causation to any trends that are observed. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, so in the back, we have Eastern Kentucky with lung cancer um, and incidence rates. What's plotted is the concentration of beryllium at different depths in the soil. Um, beryllium is a known lung carcinogen. So this area, um, you know, we, when we 
account for risk factors such as tobacco smoke and radon exposure, what we're seeing, um, there's still something else that's happening there that's not captured by behavioral stuff or, or radon. So after I looked at soil, I wondered, well, um, what do we see in the water? Um, because runoff. And so that's the circles show um, locations where beryllium was measured in stream sediments. And the coverage is much more extensive than what we see with the soils. And we still see that beryllium is fairly elevated in areas where there are also high uh, lung cancer rates. And so then I asked myself, well, where could this um, be coming from? And so uh, I looked, downloaded data from um, our KGS warehouse and looked at coal data because this area ha is, has a historical um, use, has historical coal mining and beryllium is found in these, um, in these different coal samples that were collected. So this certainly doesn't, isn't intended to say, oh, beryllium must be the reason that all of this is happening. But what it does show us is that there may be a relationship that can be pursued further. And it also shows us um, areas where we could go to collect more data or where more data are needed. So lastly, as I finish up, the next step is where, where are we going? And certainly we, we need to approach uh, future projects with an interdependent sort of focus and approach. We need to develop a common vision, something that's more of an iterative, iterative dialogue and interactive exchange of ideas with researchers in different disciplines, local stakeholders, as opposed to this sort of traditional model where um, science and the impacts of scientific research are kind of disconnected. Um, at a project level for it to take a step back, you know, I'm still continuing to add data. Um, certainly, I would, I would like to develop a user-friendly interface. And then as we build this um, into a broader relational database, it would require input from you know, people in other departments and colleges at the university and local stakeholders. And so the graphic, I realize it's busy, but it, it shows the sort of new model of how, um, of how we communicate risk, of how we can use data, and how um, these different areas, whether, it, you know, is it from research? Um, is it from the people that we are serving to the different incomes that it's, that it's all uh, interconnected? And so with that, um, I went a little over, I apologize. I would like to give a shout out to the UK CARES, um, the National Institute of Environmental Health Scientists, and certainly um, the mentorship that I received at uh, KGS, especially uh, with Bill Hanneberg, uh, Chuck Taylor, and uh, Doug Curl. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. That was a really informative presentation. And actually, I think given the delays we had going into it, we were just about exactly on time. Uh, we are running overall a little bit late though. So what I propose is uh, that we take a short break. Uh, my clock shows 3.56. So maybe if we can take just a, a couple minutes if people need to get up and stretch their legs or whatever, uh, and come back for the map blast at four. And then we can do that from four to 4.25. So we'll be closer to the original schedule and, and certainly we'll end up on time. So yeah, we'll do the um, map blast here to be a bunch of screen sharing. <laughs> I think we'll be good. How, how many people do we have lined up for that, Doug? I don't remember. We just have five. Okay. Um, 
and I'll somewhere I have the schedule that I wrote. I'll go first. You mean Massey, Bill, Max? I said that yesterday, right? Oh, yeah. Why we're why we're breaking, Steve? You want to just test sharing your screen real quick? There you go. That's good. Oh, Jason, you want to ask a question real quick? Uh, sure. Is Amy still around? Oh, there she is. She said, sure. Yeah. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention to the chat. Sorry. Uh, I just had a general question, which is probably a stupid question, but um, about geo health in general, is there, I mean, kind of thinking about it, if you have an eight ton block of sandstone following you, that's not good for your health, right? Um, sure. <laughs> so is there like a, some sort of like medical stuff that's brought into like acute versus chronic problems and thinking about geo health and like probability over short and long time scales. So like, you know, like, um, chronic problems with like water pollution versus long-term problems like climate change or very acute problems like landslides and, and sinkholes. Like, how is that, is that divided up in some sort of reasonable way or is it not really defined well? That's a great question about scale. Um, so certainly, I mean, we don't want sandstone blocks to fall on people, but I guess in that case, the cause and effect is pretty clear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's hope. Uh, but when it, when it comes to sort of, I mean, the field is relatively new. Um, you know, there are, a lot of, the, of people are sort of collecting environmental monitoring data and then going back and seeing what health data is, uh, is there. So at the moment, that, avail that data availability is sort of driving uh, current research efforts and sort of dictating uh, where it's going. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it, it, it does. It, it, I was just curious if there was, it sounds like the answer is there's not any super hard definitions on the bounds of what is considered geo health yet. Oh, okay. No, I mean, absolutely not. And it's, okay. you know, I remember, uh, you know, when I was in grad school, it was being, it was called, referred to as a medical geology. I mean, Ah, I remember that. And, yeah, and so people <laughs> like don't you know we're they're still trying to arrive at a consensus as to to what to call it. But I mean, mm -hmm. the cool thing is that you know UK and KGS, uh, it's I think it's it's the only institution, academic institution uh, in the United States with a formal geo health position and program, um, which is you know pretty uh, which is you know which is great, we're sort of leading the pack. And so um, certainly we're sort of still in the process of defining 
what GeoHealth is. I, I don't think many people want to set rigid boundaries on that because we, we want to encourage sort of creative approaches because we recognize that there are a lot of things that we haven't considered yet. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, that can be both good and bad, so. Yeah, thank you, that's, that's awesome. And I, I do remember that because I had a friend who did a master's degree in medical geology and it seemed like it they focused a lot on silicosis back then and it kind of stalled out because hazards were kind of excluded from that right. conversation so I, I didn't really know what happened to the field that's why i was kind of curious but thank you that was very important and i will say jason since you're kind of do hazard stuff that hazards um you know when i went to the agu meeting a couple of years ago hazards was just a real like a central theme for most of the geo health presentations um and so it's it's definitely a a, a main a major theme even now for for like what people are doing awesome good to know for funding thank you yep. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, AGU has a journal actually called GeoHealth, which is where we published our radon map paper, but it's open access. So if you can just navigate to through AGU to the GeoHealth, the, there's a GeoHealth section, but also the journal GeoHealth, and you can scan through that and, and get a summary of GeoHealth in terms of what people are doing and publishing about now. But it includes basically all those things you talked about from acute to chronic and climate change and you know, landslides and valley fever and tropical environments. So it's, it's a really broad field. Yeah, the GeoHealth Journal is great. Um, and if any of you are AGU members or thinking about becoming AGU members, um, you should check out the GeoHealth section. Uh, and, or if you have questions, feel free to email me. I serve as co-chair on the communications subcommittee. And, um, you know, we're, we're a very active uh, section and we would you know love to have people's different like diverse perspectives and expertise so reach out if you have questions great right. so doug let's uh do the map last and see yeah. if we can wrap it up by 4 30. uh yeah, well, i just need maybe a minute at the end for closing remarks if anything so okay um so this is our map last just really quick we're gonna have five pretty quick talks um, from various people at KGS talking about maps and GIS data. This kind of supplements the, the poster session. So um, the way this will work is Sarah Martin will keep the timer and be pretty strict about um, saying when it's five minutes and we just have to end our talks. So, um, and she'll have a little chime at, at four minutes and 30 seconds. So I will go first and I'm starting now so you can start the clock. So I'm Doug Curl. I'm head of our geoscience information section here at KGS. And um, one of the things we're responsible for is providing ways to share our data and map information online. And, and Jerry Weisenflu reminded me today that it, it's probably been 20 years since we started um, really sharing uh, data interactively um, on our website. So that's, that's pretty neat. Um, and I've been involved with that since the beginning. Um, but in the past few years, we've been developing story maps to showcase our maps and geologic information. And I'm gonna briefly talk about how to find the story maps and then talk a little bit more in depth about our newest one on Camp Nelson National Monument. So to get to the story maps, come to our website, um, this maps tab, click on geologic story maps and it opens this. Um, and this is a gallery of our different story maps that we have right now. Um, a lot of tours, but um, so I encourage you to check them out. But the one I'm gonna talk about today is about Camp Nelson National Monument, which is one of our newest national monuments in Kentucky. It's here in central Kentucky. And it has a really interesting cultural history that's tied to its geology. So open this, view it. Um, you can also click on the map and it would open like this. And um, I developed this in the uh, using the Esri um, story map builder, the newest version. And so you get this really pretty view of the um, Camp Nelson landscape. And um, like I said, I co-authored this with Drew Andrews who had a lot of interest in civil war history, particularly at Camp Nelson. 
um, and also the geologic um, information about this area. So um, it makes a really nice story, tight story to for a story map. Um, but Camp Nelson is part of the National Park Service. It's located south of Lexington, and it was a, a Union Army um, outpost um, since 1863. It was started in 1863 as a supply depot, and you can see here it is south of Lexington along the Kentucky River. And um, it was selected because of its uh, great location um, along the river, um, protected. Also, the sinkholes play a part, which I'll describe here in a minute. But it was a Union outpost uh, for a lot of different things, but it became really important when um, uh, African Americans um, escaped slavery and wanted to join the Union Army. They came here uh, to join and form um, uh, one of the training centers for the US Colored Troops. And along with, with the troops, they brought their families. And so it also became an important refugee camp that included a school and cottages. So became incredibly important in the uh, Union cause, um, the Civil War. And then um, this is, it be, later became a cemetery. So this is just the intro part. And then we really get into the history and geology, um, ge geographic setting of Camp Nelson. And this is a little bit messed up, I'm sorry. Uh, so there was a previous camp, poor location. They moved to Camp Nelson because a lot better along the, the river and, and this is the really kind of neat feature in the story map. Um, we have the scanned older map showing the camp location and then we can overlay that on the statewide LIDAR and we can move it around. And you can really get a sense of where the camp is located along the, the Palisades. Um, and so it's quite protected because here it is protected by the Palisades and really the only way in was through the north because um, we didn't have big roads and stuff like that right there. Um, and then we also had a GIS layer of building footprints and so um, extruded those heights to what we thought they were. And you can really get a sense of that layout in this 3D view. Um, and then the sinkholes play a part because, and they're supposed to turn on, <laughs> um, but the blue, there'd be blue outlines of sinkholes that uh, this worked, but. Um, they were also located in the sinkholes, and so they were doubly protected by the Palisades, but also the, um, the, the sinkhole location. So just to look at the Palisades and more history and about karst geology, and then the tour goes into a, a, a walking tour. So you can take a nice walking tour at Camp Nelson and use the story map on your phone. It works quite well. Um, and so... And then you can also visit the National Cemetery, which is um, to, a part of the of the National Monument. So I encourage you to just. Yeah, so that's out. five minutes. Okay, <clears throat> that's fine. All right, I'll stop my share. And our, our next one is Steve Martin. So this is the nature of the talks here. <laughs> they go fast. Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm Steve Martin in the geologic mapping section, and uh, I'm creating a joint database and a layer that will go on to our geologic map service. Um, this is in progress, and what I have uh, shown on the screen right here is a compilation of the joints uh, we digitized uh, when we digitized the geologic maps. So this is our DVGQ joint data. Um, I have this symbolized, the dipping joints are in red, vertical joints are in black, and the vertical sets are in blue. And uh, you can click on one of these and you get some information about the location. And you scroll down and uh, a little bit more measurement information about the map units, the lithology, and the orientation of the data. And um, this is for future data, uh, we can I can populate uh, some more attributes. But I wanted to uh, first start off with the DVGQ data. Uh, eventually, I will add uh, joint data that I've collected uh, along various road, cut, road cuts and uh, natural arches. Um, and with that, I want to um, switch and go to 
uh, a project I'm also creating for a collector app, so to collect um, data in the field. And in this uh, map right here, I've included data that I have collected in the field. I'll symbolize this real quick. And you can see here the DVGQ data is in the red and uh, the data I've collected is in the blue. And so one question or one uh, issue I need to solve when I show this for the map service is uh, how am I gonna symbolize my data? Because a lot of times my data is symbolized by rose diagrams. So it's possible you could click on this and you could get information about the joint and also maybe get an image of the rose diagram. Um, one thing that uh, Doug mentioned uh, that I think is a really great idea, and this is going back to the map service, is um, oh, these things, can you go on? There you go, is to cluster this data. And um, we might have to set some boundaries as far as, far as faulting is concerned, but uh, wouldn't it be cool if we could create rose diagrams on the fly based on uh, on the scale as we zoom in and out? Um, so that's something I might try to uh, work for uh, in the future for displaying our joint data uh, on the map service. Um, let me see. Can I move this bar? There we go. Get out of here, bar. Um, Another uh, database that I'm working on is a uh, natural arch database. And um, I've uh, created a, a figure here and a map that shows the distribution of natural arches I've visited, but also the number of natural arches uh, by county. This uh, data set uh, was provided by citizen scientists throughout the state. Most of this is by Todd and Victor Fife. Uh, Bill Patrick uh, provide a lot of information for Powell and Wolf counties. Uh, we have contributions from Christopher Morris. Um, Bill Fultz and Randall Miller provided information for Laurel County. And uh, bless his heart, Mervyn Wood, I've not met the gentleman, but he's uh, uh, documented over 600 natural arch locations in McCreary County. And we also have contributions from um, Stephen Bowling in Breathitt County and uh, Nita Collier in Martin County. And we'd like to close with a picture of uh, Mantle Rock. Uh, went there earlier in the year. It's the uh, largest spanned arch in Kentucky. It's a very, uh, it's a alcove natural arch and these types of arches are, are very common in Kentucky. And uh, you can see a joint set on the outer set, outer of the, of the arch, and uh, another joint set behind. And what happens is uh, water will seep through this joint set next to the cliff line here and physically and chemically erode the rock and uh, uh, results in these nice big long. Um, Five minutes. Thank you. Next, we have Matt Massey coming up. Is that showing up? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, KGS, we've been mapping surficial geology since 2004. And since then we've completed 102 seven and a half minute quadrangles or pieces of quadrangles. And we'll have four new ones to add to that number uh, by July. Within the past couple of years, the USGS, they've implemented an 
a new GIS data schema called GEMS. And that's really enabled us to organize our data in, into a cohesive compilation. Uh, so this winter, we started um, adding the official data to our online map service, which you get to just like the other online map service um, through our website. And then you can choose the surficial layer um, once that loads up, but I've got it kind of preloaded here on this tab. Um, so right now we have 20 quadrangles of, of surficial geology from Boone, Kenton and Campbell counties in Northern Kentucky up here. Uh, and we have eight quadrangles from the Hardin County area which uh, we've been mapping for the past several years and we're currently mapping. Um, we started just with this data because they were the most recent, they're the most well organized in the new gym schema and everything is geologically reconciled, meaning there's no data bus along quadrangle boundaries. So everything matches up perfectly. Um, at the moment, we just have lithologic polygons and contacts, um, which can be explored with the ID tool uh, and the various ma base maps. Here I've got uh, the surficial data. I'm gonna increase the opacity a little bit or decrease opacity. And this is overlaid on the multi-directional hill shade image, um, just because I think it does a good job at showing the relationship between surficial deposits and landforms. Um, yeah, and you can explore this data just like you would any other geologic data on our map service. Um, the ID tool, it brings up um, quite a few different fields which aren't really that important unless you're but they're required for the GEMS data schema. Uh, I guess the best ones, most useful ones are the kind of the name, uh, the symbol, and then the geologic description. Um, so that's all linked together. Uh, and that's really nice. Um, we actually have a lot more data to add to the web, web service, obviously. We have a lot more lithologic and contact coverage from our continuing mapping and the old GQs and older mapping. Uh, but we also have a lot of analytical data to add uh, that we'll be adding over the next several months um, or so. <laughs> uh, but we have locations of field work with outcrop photos. We have water wells, oil and gas wells and geotechnical boring locations depth to bedrock information, sample locations, descriptions and petrography with thin section photomicrograph images. Uh, we have XRD and XRF geochemistry data with XRD spectrograph images and grain size data with grain size distribution plot images. Um, and then all of this data, it's available on the web service, but it's also gonna be available as downloads from the UK Knowledge website, um, where you can download the data in a series of geo databases and GIS files. And all of these files here, they'll be versioned. So as the map is updated on the online service, it will be updated here too, and the version number will be changed accordingly. And yeah, everyone will be up to date and have access to the latest data that we have. So that's all I have. Great. Thanks, Matt. That was awesome. Um, yes, we will be adding that other data soon. <laughs> Get to that. That's on me. Um, so our next speaker is Bill Hanneberg with Radon. Okay, well, there you go. So this is gonna be a really quick presentation of what was the backup presentation in case we had any trouble today. 
during the, the seminar. Uh, but radon is, is major public health hazard in Kentucky. Uh, it's the second leading cause of lung cancer in the country. And if you are a smoker who lives in a home at the EPA action level, you have about a nine times greater chance of contracting lung cancer than somebody who doesn't. So it's a, a major issue in Kentucky because of our high smoking rates. And we also have the second highest cancer incidence rate in the country. Uh, the previous maps were based on county lines. That was pretty much the conventional way to do it. And there are a lot of reasons for organizing things by county, but geology isn't one of them. And radon comes from rocks. It's a product of the uranium decay series. It's completely natural. So it makes much more sense to try to understand radon distributions in terms of the underlying bedrock. So we worked with some of our colleagues in the uh, UK Breathe program in the College of Nursing, Ellen Hans group. Uh, they had available uh, a total of 71,930 radon home test kit values collected over 20 years. And you can see those here distributed across the map. Of course, they're denser in the urban areas and uh, sparser in, in the rural areas. Uh, we took those and of course, we could have just tried to interpolate those or make some sort of contour map of them. But we also had this great geological map coverage that we talk about quite a bit. And this is one of the ways we could really leverage that to make some value added products out of a, a basic geologic map. So we took that large radon data set and intersected it with the geological map and calculated the, the, the statistical distribution of the in-home radon values for each of the formations on the map. Uh, and, and we ended up with 106 different radon geologic map units. And of course, that would be a kind of a complicated map. So we further classified them into five groups of, you see here on the left, minus 2.7, Picocuries per liter, which is the World Health Organization standard, uh, then 2.7 to 4. 4 is the EPA uh, standard for, for an action level, and then 4 to 8, 8 to 16, and above 16. Uh, and, and this is the final map. If you look at it, you, you immediately think it looks kind of like the geological map in terms of the overall pattern, and that makes sense. Uh, we've also put that uh, you can access it through two paths on our website through the map service, and also it's available as a separate radon map under geological hazards. So this is what it looks like uh, if you go through the, the radon map route. Uh, same map as before, the colors show up a little bit different on the screen. The really nice thing about it is you can click on a point or you can even type in your address uh, and it'll tell you, it'll give you radon information about that county. Uh, so you see one of the screens here that you the little uh, pop-up windows and then you can learn uh, more about the, the formation you've clicked on, its map symbol, the number of radon tests. So for example, St. Louis Limestone had 6,007 tests. Uh, the third quartile measurement is important because that's what we actually used for the map units. Uh, there's a long story about the discussion among public health uh, communicators and risk and hazard and why we chose the third quartile. Uh, but I'll just say there, there are some valid epidemiological reasons for doing that instead of say the mean or the medium, uh, even having to do with the, the log normal distribution of radon values. And then it also, if you click on one of those, you can, they're hyperlinked to county specific radon infographics that Ellen Hans Breathe Group uh, in the College of Nursing made. And you can see those also use our map. And then again, a lot of time was spent on these, making sure they're, they're intelligible and useful to people who don't necessarily have a background in geology or epidemiology or public health. Uh, there are some really interesting geological findings, too. So here are 20 monolithological formations we pulled out of the 106 formations to take a look. And you can see that that clastic sedimentary rocks, uh, uh, superficial deposits, and sandstones and siltstones have noticeably lower levels than carbonates. Uh, shales, the black units down at the bottom, span a pretty wide range. Uh, people are often surprised that the carbonate rocks actually had the highest potential. Uh, the black uh, Devonian black shales had high potential too, but if you look at other shaley units like the Waldron shale or the, the Clays Ferry uh, Cope combined, they actually had fairly low, uh, probably that case because they were elitic. Uh, again, here's a distinct difference between limestone, dolostone shale, sandstone, and surficial units. And then if you'd like more information, you can scan the QR code and you'll go to a, an open access paper in GeoHealth about the state radon map and quickly read through the acknowledgements and including the fact that some of this is funded by an NIEHS grant through the UK CARES Research Center. And that's it for me. Great, thanks.
Thanks, Bill. Um, and our last talk is from Max Hammond, Digital Terrain Modeling of Colluvium. And then um, Bill makes some final comments and we'll leave the Zoom open in case people wanna ask more questions of people. So. Hi guys, I'm Max Hammond with the Geologic Mapping section. Um, project that I've been working on here lately, working on it for our masters, but also helping to benefit state map and how we map some of our most common units. I've been working on the geomorphic quantification of colluvium from LIDAR data for the Demosville and Valley Station quads in Kentucky. So the approach that I've been using to this, um, I've looked at different ways to model colluvium across across the valley station quad as far as using different parameters of uh, the different resolutions that you can use to resample the DEMs from, uh, you know, to get the slope maps, the curvature maps and the roughness maps. This right here is just showing a slope map and um, how I pulled out the values that we think are colluvium. And from this data right here, what we did was we, um, assigned random points throughout the quad, a valley station. So that there's a point at least every 150 meters. So that gave me a thousand points across the whole area. And I looked at those, how those were mapped by hand from previous state map uh, years. So I think we did this one in 2015. And as you can see, the points there vary across the terrain. You know, we've got them down in the, you know, alluvial valley there. We've got them along the colluvial slope, we've got them up top on the ridge tops, we've got some alluvial fans just spread out across all map units. But what I really wanted to focus on was the QC, but also how it differentiated from QR and from alluvium. So this is the attribute table that I pulled out from doing um, the slope curvature and roughness values at each one of those points. Um, I've just got the QC here for you guys to look at so you can see that how it varies in um, the values that it's pulling out. Um, you know, you can see on this, just this section of probably 20, 25 points, the slope value ranges from, looks like a low of five degrees all the way to a high of 31 degrees. And then we've got varying curvature, roughness and elevation values. Over here to the right side, this was just different ways to look at the different ways to resample the DEM. Uh, and making the colluvia model from there at 12 degrees, 12 degrees and 10 degrees based off the uh, detail of the DEM. And these are the histograms um, from the QC, QAL and QR that was pulled out of the Valley Station quad. So you can see how the distribution of slope changes across each one of these with the QR, uh, you know, showing the lowest slope values there. Uh, the curvature, you know, how it has different peaks across each each unit and how those values change. And then the distribution of roughness, um, you know, with the different peaks and valleys there. Um, so we're still working, I'm still working on it. And the purpose of doing this is to try to come up with the best model that I possibly can to help us with our mapping because one of the most labor intensive um, units to map by hand was the colluvium. If I can model the colluvium, then I almost get the meat to the sandwich, meaning like the QC is usually bound by QR and QAL. So that gives us several boundaries there to speed up the mapping process and to focus on uh, other areas that we need to spend more time on uh, picking apart and mapping. So uh, yeah, that wraps it up. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks Sarah Martin for doing the timer. That was very helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. So we, we had some closing remarks scheduled and I'm just noticing it's, it's 431. So I want to respect everybody's time and, and I, I won't say uh, too much here, but I did just want to thank everybody for attending and sticking it out until 430. Uh, we're glad you're here and we appreciate your interest in KGS. Uh, if you have any questions about the presentations, uh, please reach out to us and we'll do the best to provide additional information and answers. Uh, we had a couple of glitches today, but I think they, they were pretty minor and overall things went really well. Uh, and we hope we'll see you all back in person next year. So thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.
leave it open if anybody has any questions or just wants to chit chat or anything. So. Hey, Doug, there's a question about the, where to get the recording. Yeah, I was responding. I, I realized I could just say that. Um, we're going to, we'll share it on YouTube and then we'll advertise it, social media and, um, and our website. And um, so stay tuned. Um, it'll take us a little bit to just get it together and put it on YouTube and, and things. So, um, but but yeah, thanks. And we didn't record the um, poster sessions because I don't even know how you would do that. But um, so it'll just be the talks and the lightning talks. <laughs>